and two, the war of the flesh and spirit, a statement that's made, and we're going to get into that, page 12. Point number one, the triune or three-part makeup of man, and A, of course, it's body, a soul, and spirit, and let's read these so we know where they are and have a, a solid place to refer to, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And the very God of peace, Paul is finishing his first letter to the ch church of Thessalonica. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he names three separate parts, of course, God being triune, three in one. We're made up of him and his image. We have three parts as well. And then Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, which represent the physical body, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So we have three different parts of man mentioned here. And finally, back in Mark 12.30, Christ is asked, which is the greatest commandment of all? And he answers here in verse 30. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, that's spirit man, with all of your soul. Soul, of course, refers to, usually if it's in along with the spirit of the heart, refers to the emotions or feelings with all of your mind. Uh, which is part of the spirit and with all of your strength the physical body this is the first commandment now let me uh, just put here on the board for a moment <clears throat> we'll get into this but to help you clarify right now the spirit of the man is also called the heart the soul is usually the emotions and feeling which are part of our makeup Without these, we wouldn't uh, be able to respect or have any indication of the joy and so forth of the spirit or heart decision. And of course, the body houses here the five senses. Now, there are certain times, this is, this is the triune makeup of man, kind, there are times when the word spirit refers to, spirit or spirits, refers to the whole man. And uh, you're just looking not at, uh, not at the spiritual part of him, but you're looking here at a whole man being addressed as the spirit, the spirit of just men made perfect, speaking of the whole man. There are times when the word soul or souls refer to the whole man. Not to be confused with emotions and feelings. Now, context of reading will always tip you off whether it's talking about the spiritual part of the man, this is the part that's accountable to God, these two parts are not, whether it's the whole man or whether it's talking about the spirit part of him that's accountable to God. Uh, this many times it refers to the will. Sometimes the mind is included in here with that. Well, this is the image of God. Animals have feelings and emotions, although limited because they don't have a mind to express like we do. And of course, all animals have physical bodies. This is the unique part. And many times you'll see that souls <clears throat> is used to describe uh, a person or persons like the, there were eight souls saved in the ark he didn't mean there were eight emotions and feelings that were saved so context always dictates how these are used but you must remember and I've gone back and studied it all in the Hebrew and Greek to discern that sometimes this pops in and has nothing to do with these two here it's like the word flesh flesh can mean physical body or flesh can mean unregenerate nature but the scripture you're reading at the time will always tip you off. So Christ gives you the three views here. B, the Hebrew and Greek define body, soul, and spirit. Number one, flesh. In the Old Testament, it was the Hebrew word basar, 
In the New Testament, it's the word sarax, which means body or passionate, selfish, dominant nature. That means it's unregenerated. <clears throat> service to self dominates over service to God and others. Or it's a self-interest motivation, not regenerated or born again. Or it's a physical body. We're dealing with it right at this moment as a physical body. Soul in the Old Testament Hebrew is nepish. In the New Testament, soul is used as suki. A breathing creature of appetites and desires. An animal sentient principle only. That is, soul speaks of that which animals have. In this sense right here, it's only speaking of emotions or feelings, sensibilities, but it has nothing to do with the heart of man or accountability to God in that sense. All right. <clears throat> so it rules out anything that animals don't have. Whatever an animal has, that's in a man also. An animal sentient principle. Spirit, number three. Old Testament is rock in the Hebrew and pneuma in the New Testament Greek. It's the rational, now this is where you realize you're made in the image of God. It's the rational, the thinking, ability, decision-making part of any free moral agent. Man has it, demons, angels, the Holy Ghost, Father, Son, all have that. C. Webster, who was a Christian, defined soul and spirit. Soul, man's emotional nature, a quality that arouses emotion and sentiment. Spirit, it's a disposition of the mind, mental inclination, intelligence, and we could even add to that ability to make choice. D, the content of the body, soul, and spirit. The body has the senses of seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, and hearing. Has appetites of breath, hunger, thirst, and sleep. Those are all natural things. Nothing in any of that is sinful unless it's given into by the will to allow those things in the body to create or crave something and you give in to it and go and something that would be hurting the temple of God. But nothing wrong with the way God made it. It's how we would use it. <clears throat> that uh, body then, of course, B is connected to the world. It's a world consciousness by feeling the senses, tasting, smelling, hearing, so forth. To the soul, Appetites, desires, emotions, affections, and attitudes are felt. This is connection to yourself. This is a self-consciousness or self-awareness that you have feelings and emotions about various circumstances and things and attitudes and uh, that are there, and that's, that's connected to you. The first is the body of the world. Second is to you. The third one, spiritual, has to do with attitudes, desires, affections originated here. This is where the will, the conscience, the intellect, thoughts, reasonings, memory, imagination. This is the image of God back in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 when he said, let us make man in our image. This is the part that's different from the animal. B, this is connection to God or God consciousness. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians just a moment. 2, 10 and 11. This is the part that must be connected to God. Let's start maybe at verse 9 and go 9 through 11 here. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, the natural eye has not seen, nor the natural ear has never heard, neither has entered into the natural heart of the natural man the spiritual things which God has prepared for them that love him. But, verse 10, God has revealed them unto us, the born-again ones, the spirit-filled ones. He's revealed them to us by his Holy Spirit, who is going to lead and teach us and guide us into all truth. For the Holy Spirit searches all things within us, yea, the deep things of God, trying to determine where we are, where we need to go next. 
Verse 11, For what man, woman, boy, or girl, knoweth the things of another man, boy, or girl, or woman, except or save the spirit of man which is in him? That's the, that's the true person in there. The body, the emotions, nothing. It's who is this person. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man except by the Spirit of God, and you'd have to be in relationship with him to have that. Now let's look at E, some facts about the body, soul, and spirit. The body is like a house or container. It contains the spirit, man, and his soul. The body cannot sin of itself. I've heard so much teaching on, well, that was my body that wanted the drugs. It was my body that wanted the sex. My spirit man really didn't want it. And on and on. The, the body, the body did this. Sin is in the flesh here. See, now when the Bible tells you sin is in the flesh, it's talking about it's in an unregenerate person. But the religious system out here says, no, sin is in the flesh body. My spirit is born again, but the sin is in here. The lust is in here. I'm out murdering people. I'm on drugs. I'm in a sexual thing. Uh, that's just my physical body. Inside, I've got a real nice relationship going on with God. You see how they twist that? They don't know what they're talking about. Flesh, body, is sinless. Christ came and was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, wasn't he? He wasn't made a sinner, but he was made in the likeness of sinful bodies or people on this earth. Sinful flesh, using flesh bodies to sin with, our eyes, nose, elbows, and so forth, they can't sin. The body's merely created to carry out the desires of the inner man or the spirit man. Two, the soul. It's a part of man that feels. That's about the best way to describe it. Sensibilities, feelings, and emotions. It's a part of man that feels. The body would know no pain, pleasure, or appetite except for the soul. The soul does not know right from wrong, hence it cannot sin. It sends sense feelings and impulses back to the intelligence. It does not originate any attitudes, desires, or appetites, affections, or feelings. The soul is the part of man that feels all of these after it's triggered either from the body or the spirit. The soul merely reacts to that which the body is experiencing or which the mind and imagination is involving in. Because you and I can stand here and think of something in our imagination right now that just makes us feel warm and gushy and, you know, ooh, ooh. But there, we haven't done anything, it's just in our mind. And so the emotions and feelings respond to it. Or the, they can respond to whatever the body's involved in. So the soul is the part of man that feels. All of these after being triggered from the body and or the spirit. Three, the spirit. It's the part of man that knows. That's the easiest thing to remember. It's the knowledge part of the creation of man. It knows right from wrong, has a conscience. God already says in Romans 1, 18 through 20, they're guilty. The heathen are guilty. Everything that may be known about God in a moral aspect is already revealed within them. And there's the outer witness of a design, a designer. The designer is God, of course. It reasons. It has intellect so it can think things through. It remembers. It has a memory. It chooses right from wrong. Shows it has a will. This is all in the spirit makeup of men. Let's look at Matthew 26, 41. Jesus to the disciples as he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, and he takes with him Peter, James, and John and moves in a little closer away from the rest of them. And he says to them in 41, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Watch means to be spiritually alert and pray that you enter not into temptation. He said the Spirit is willing. Your mind, your heart, your will, your memory, what you know, your conscience, your intellect. But the flesh body is weak. It can fall asleep on you. It wants food, needs to do this, wants to do that, and you cater to it. So he said, be careful of that. 
in Mark 2, 8. And immediately when Jesus perceived in the spirit that they so reasoned within themselves. Now, he didn't hear them talking. They were just reasoning. He said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? See, the Holy Spirit revealed to them that in their heart, in the spirit man, which would be their mind and imagination, the ability to think they were reasoning things that weren't right before God. And so the Spirit shows him what they're reasoning. It's alive. It's alert. They brought it into existence. The Spirit reveals it to Christ. And it's in their heart of the spirit man. 1 Corinthians 2.11. I think we already read that, but let's look once more. Make sure. Yep. One man knoweth the things of another man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knows no man except by the spirit of God. All right, page 13, point four. We want to look here at scriptures showing the use of the body, soul, and spirit as one whole unit that is working together. So let's start back in Matthew 16, 26 and walk through some of these. Jesus says, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Here the word soul is talking about the whole man's life. It's not limited to his feelings and emotions. So here again we have a different use of it. What would it, what would it profit him if he gained the whole world with all the money and fame and fortune and he lost his own life, his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul or his life? What could he possibly do? Nothing except to God. Luke 12, 19. He's talking here about covetousness. And he speaks a parable here about a rich man that brought forth a lot of excess in verse 16 in his worldly life. Verse 17, the rich man thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. So the rich man said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. God said unto him, Thy fool, tonight thy soul shall be required of thee. But the soul being required is his life, speaking, spoken of as an entire individual, not just the feeling or emotion part of him. Acts 2.27 David, this is being quoted uh, of a statement that David made back in Psalms 16.8 David says, because thou will not leave my soul. Now the soul here can't mean his body, but it means the eternal part of him, which now the spirit man is being used and use the word with soul. And again, context tells you, it's not talking about his body, the whole man, that eternal part of him in which the emotions and feelings are connected to, but the spirit, the image of God, you're not going to leave it in hell he will you suffer your holy one to see corruption. Romans 2.9. Romans 2.9, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man. That's anguish and tribulation has to be in the spirit part of man. So here the word soul is being used to cover that part of man that knows. That connection to God. There is soul of man that doeth evil, the Jew first and also the Gentile. Tribulation, anguish can't be limited to just the feelings and emotions it goes into his conscience and therefore it's representing the whole image of God Romans 13 1 Paul opens this up to the Romans talking about obedience to civil and earthly rulers let every soul every person every being see, be subject unto the higher powers for there is no power but of God the powers that be in any country are ordained or ordered of God. He sets the kings up, he takes the kings down. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he directeth it wherever he will, like a river, the Old Testament says. All right, James 5, 19 and 20 has to do with a brother who falls away and how to handle him. What you can do for him and the results. 
James 5.19, Brethren, if by choice any of you do err or sins from or away from the truth, and one converts him. Notice that a brother who sins needs to be converted back to Christ by confession, repentance of his sins. Let him know that he which converts the sinner, here the brother who falls away is now called a sinner, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of the sin of his way saves the soul from death. But he's not talking about feelings and emotions. He's talking about the whole individual, saving him from eternal death. And in the saving, confession, repentance, he hides a multitude of sins because God forgives him, forgets him, and washes them away. Second Peter 2.8. Let's we'll start about verse 7 because it's talking about Lot being delivered from the ungodly. And he delivered just Lot, which means he was justified before God in the Old Testament sense. He vexed. He was vexed or tormented with the filthy conversation or behavior of the wicked. For that righteous man, Lot's called a righteous man, under the Old Testament economy of obeying everything God wanted, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing all day long, he vexed or tormented his righteous soul, his righteous spirit man that was in obedience to God. Now remember, he was not free of sin, he was not born again, he was not baptized. But his righteous soul was the intelligent man part, so it's used again in the spirit sense here, from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And finally, 3 John 2, and we'll close here for tonight. No chapters. This is a wonderful verse. I quote it many, many times. Beloved, or beloved, I wish above all things. So here's John writing to the church. The theme is truth. I wish above all things, above all things else, here it is, that you may prosper and be in physical health. So that's one of his prayers, that you might be in physical health. Prosper was the first one he mentions, and that's materially, that you may prosper in the material realm and be in divine health. But notice it's going to be in proportion as the last thing he says, even as your soul. Here it is again, speaking of the spiritual or the total image of the God-man. Even as your soul prospers, it can't be referring to just his emotions and feelings. So these are some scriptures that people usually get confused in, but we wanted to define these three areas and then show you some of the transliterations of how the word is used in other places. We'll come back next week, the Lord willing. In the church worldwide, people have embraced a wrong meaning to the war of the flesh and the spirit. And we're told by the church at large that that's when you're born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and you still have sin in your conscience because you're sinning every day in word, thought, and deed. You've got this constant war going on within you. And they arrive at this by taking teachings of Paul, basically, and twisting or wrestling it, as it says, to their own destruction. The war of the flesh and the spirit is not anything within a Christian that's happening. As we'll see, it takes place in a person who has been saved, who knows the word of God especially, and then goes back into sin, and he's got a warfare going on him because of the truth that he has known and the experience that he's had. But it's nothing that a Christian is involved in, because a Christian is free of sin. He that is born of God sinneth not. The moment that you sin, you're no longer of God. That needs to be confessed, taken care of. He's faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But we are not in a relationship with God apart from being clean from sin. That's how we get in the kingdom. That's how we remain in the kingdom. And any doctrine... <clears throat> any creed from any church that tells you that we can be in sin and be in Christ uh, is uh, antichrist. It's right out of the pit. And this is the greatest lie, of course, that Satan has ever released to mankind. And he did it to Adam and Eve that they could eat of the tree which God forbade them. God said, the day you eat of the tree, you're dead. And he tells him, you can eat of the tree and uh, you will not die. Surely thou shalt not die. So it's necessary, as I mentioned at the beginning of other classes, that we understand the doctrine of sin simply and thoroughly, 
Uh, for if we do not understand the doctrine of sin, we have no way to understand really the love of God. Now people think they understand the love of God who are living in a state of sin. When they do that, they don't even understand the love of God. So it takes, first of all, according to John chapter 16, where it tells you the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was teaching this, that when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to do three things. And the first thing that Jesus said, he's going to reprove or convince the world of sin. That's his first job. The second job of the Holy Spirit, to those that respond to the message of sin and repent and come before God with godly sorrow and godly repentance, confessing their sins and receiving Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit will unfold the righteousness that comes from God. But you're not going to go anywhere in understanding the righteousness of God or anything else, not even judgment. You wouldn't even understand what judgment is if you believe you can live in sin and be in Christ. No concept of judgment. So in order to understand the real attributes of God, we have to understand what sin is and the depths of sin, what it does to us, how it affects us, and how it deadens us. And then when we see what sin does, then we can move to understanding uh, God's righteousness and how he has made it possible for us to be released from sin. And we have to be released totally, completely washed and cleansed from all sin before we can even get in the kingdom. And how any church or pastor or anybody could preach a message on the fact that we could go back into sin after we had to be free from sin to get in the kingdom and then we could go back into it, I don't understand. Of course, I used to believe that myself. But I don't understand today. But I understand that men are pleasing men. And uh, the church wants great numbers, it wants great buildings, it wants great recognition, great success. And in doing so, it doesn't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It preaches another gospel that Paul addressed that problem in Galatians. So on page 13, we're ready to start Roman numeral number 2, <clears throat> under the war of flesh and spirit. We're going to discuss tonight, briefly, temptation and sin. And you need to understand this. If you ever have any questions, of course, raise your hand and we'll work with you on it. Under A, temptation defined. Number one, temptation takes place when a soulish feeling is triggered from the body. Now, we've made a difference here between the body and the spirit. Some kind of feeling is triggered from the body. We have number one, the five senses. Smelling, tasting, eating, so forth, touching, all of that is implied in the body. Number two, bodily appetites. The body has hunger, the body has different uh, food uh, appetites and so forth, and so temptation can be triggered uh, from the body one way or another. The second is it can be from the spirit. The spirit part of man. Number one, the memory of what the five senses have recorded in the past how we enjoyed something, had pleasure in something, and so forth, that gave us a great uh, feeling. Number two, new thoughts. New thoughts that uh, suggest the breaking of God's law to the intellect. You can do this, you could do this, you could get away with this. A temptation in that moment. The moment when the spirit man is deciding if he will break the law by succumbing to that thought or feeling by outward action or continued meditation. So temptation is going to come from within, from your body, from within the spirit. And of course, the enemy can try to lay all kinds of things on you if you're willing to be open to them. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. For here we have a scripture on temptation that needs to be the first one that you would be looking at. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There has no temptation taken you. There's no temptation that's come upon you, but such as is common to man. That is, there isn't any temptation that's ever come to you, but what hasn't been experienced by Adam and Eve right on through everybody in the world. And of course, all temptation can be bubbled down to lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. 
So there's no temptation that's ever come to you. But sometimes when temptation comes to us, we think this is, uh, we're the only one, we're the original one going through what we're going through, and nobody else has ever been tempted like we've been tempted. Well, God is telling you that's not true. That everybody from Adam and Eve on have been subjected to all three of the basic temptations. So it's common to all men. But with the temptation now, God is faithful. God is faithful. He's there ready to work on our behalf. God is faithful who will not suffer or allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. That is, God will not permit the enemy or your own desires enter from the body or spirit to have a temptation that is greater than what you are able to cast down to put away or stop dwelling on it. That's his part. That's the way he's designed us. That's the way he's made us. And of course, those of us who are free of sin and don't have all this baggage of past sins, those of us who have been saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and have the power of the Holy Ghost working with us, this is especially true. That God will not permit or allow, by design, any temptation to come to you, but what we are not able to overcome it but God will with any temptation that comes to us also make a way of escape the escape is to put the temptation down leave it alone don't dwell on it don't begin to lust and think about it and get into sin in the temptation area so God will with that temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear the temptation by overcoming it and putting it down. And this is where the word overcoming, which is all through the New Testament, applies. The thing that God is directing the word overcoming to is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. <clears throat> the things that the world presents to us. And if we're going to overcome, uh, that means that we're going to not permit that thought that temptation to take root in us, but to discharge it and to put it away and not dwell on it anymore. <clears throat> or if we have sinned, if we give in to it and we find ourselves in a state of sin dwelling on it with the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes of pride of life, that we will confess that immediately, First John 1, 9, that it will not go any further than just <clears throat> moments or a minute or so or whatever in our mind and then we realize what we're doing and we stop and we confess that sin immediately according to 1 John 1 9 when we confess the sin we're also in a state of overcoming right there we're overcoming the sin putting it down and God's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from the unrighteousness of that particular thought or sin then we want to go over to James 1 12 through 16 who the half-brother of Christ lays it out, very simple, how this works when it comes. James 1, 12 through 16. Verse 12, blessed or blessed is the man, woman, boy or girl that endures temptation. It comes and you do not let it get started. For when he is tried, tested, and proven through life, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Now, love, as we understand it, is more than just a gushy, huggy, kissy feeling. It goes beyond emotion. Our love, or the proof of our love to God, is the fact that we will obey his commandments, his word, his truth. Of necessity, there will be feelings and emotions that go with that. But love is counted by God as obeying his word. He that loves me keepeth my word. He that loveth me not keepeth not my word. If a man loves me, he will keep my words. If you are my friends, you will obey the commandments that I've given you. About 11 definitions of love in the New Testament, all by John, by the way. In the Gospel of John, or 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, define 11 defini definitions of love and are all the same. Obedience to the word. All right, verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted that I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth God any man with evil. But every man is tempted, and now he defines what temptation is, and how it works. 
Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. And he's enticed or trapped. So let's look at this for a moment in a drawing. The person has a mind attached to that. He has a memory. Um, <clears throat> he has an imagination. And here he's got the five senses built within him. And so this is the spirit part of man here that was made in the image of God. So temptation can come from within, from the spirit. It can come from the, any of the five senses and the temp temptation can be from within. And there's also the Satan trying to bring to our mind various temptations from without, and this is done in many, many other ways. So this is what he's trying to tell us about overcoming, that whenever this happens, God has made a way. No man can say he's being tempted of God because he's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. So the heart of the man, it's called heart, in the Bible, but the heart speaks of the will or the center of choice. The ability to make choice. And so if we're drawn away, if we move from the temptation, now there's no sin in any temptation. The temptation, Christ faced all the temptations we do, and we'll cover some of those in Matthew 4 in a minute. But the temptation, if we, by the will or center of our choice of the heart, give in to the temptation, then that becomes the sin. When we begin then to dwell on it and lust after it. But we're drawn away of our own lust. If we begin to dwell upon this temptation that comes, then we move into ultimately sin and ultimately in right there in just a matter of moments into spiritual death. And this is what he teaches us. Let no man say in verse 13, when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man with evil, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and he's enticed or trapped because he begins to use his will, his imagination, begin to pictures this lust being fulfilled in some way and he is dead in just a matter of seconds here because he explains this in verse 15. When the lust has conceived, when you go from having the temptation there and it's in your thought life and you then begin to lust after this temptation, when lust has conceived or it comes forth as truly lust, it then produces or brings forth sin. And sin, the final product of it finishing, and this is just a matter of moments, is spiritual death. He says in verse 16, do not err, do not sin, my beloved brother. If we were going to be able to live in sin and be in Christ, then verse 16, by the half-brother of Christ and the Holy Ghost, would be a lie. So we're tempted. Let's walk through this. Temptation comes. And we're going to do one of two things with the temptation. <clears throat> we're going to cast it down. That is, we're going to shut it off. And this will be by our will, by our choice. Or we're going to begin to lust after this temptation and this will then immediately bring forth the sin and then it immediately brings forth spiritual death and this is very clearer than what James has written now we'll look at this side over here and see how this is done but he spells it out pretty simple there we, we can't miss it let's go back into 
And you may want to mark this on your, uh, it's not on your outlines. Let's go back into 2 Corinthians 10.5. And you, we need to put that on our outline. It needs to be a part of it. Right after James. Second Corinthians 10.5. This is how we as Christians are to handle the casting down or shutting off by our will, the temptation when it comes. Because we realize what it is when we see it. It's not a sin. We realize what it is if we move on with it. 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imaginations, reasonings, and every high thing or any high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In other words, the temptation must try to overpower you in such a way that it rises above the word of God like a snake like a power or authority. It's going to place itself up here and say, you need this worse than you're believing in the Word of God. So it's exalting itself above the Word of God against his knowledge. And in casting it down, number two part of this, we must bring into captivity. This is by a choice of our will. We cast down by the will. And number two, by the choice of the will, we bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ Jesus. The temptation comes, we realize what it is, and we change channels by the will. We take our mind off from it, divert it to something else. We have that power, and that's the power that God has given us. That with the temptation, God makes a way of escape, but the way of escape is not God causing the temptation or the lust to leave, it is us casting down the imagination, putting that away which is attacking us, and diverting it to something else. And as uh, we saw Christ on the cross, he quoted the scripture, didn't he? When he was tempted. Prime targets of temptation. Let's go here to 1 John 2, 16. And here it names them for us for the third and last time in the Bible. Genesis gives us these three, and Matthew and Luke give us the three, and then we find at the end they're mentioned again. John says here in 1 John 2.16, For all that is in the world, the ungodly, unregenerated, lustful world, is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. None of that is of the Father. It is of the world, or the unregenerate nature of the world. So A, under B, prime target of Temptation, one is 1 John 2, 16a, desire is triggered by the five senses. We're going to look at it with our eyes, begin to imagine, to think, to dwell on it. B, appetites triggered by the flesh, body, hunger, thirst, and we're going to substitute a temptation for uh, that pleasure. C, self-confidence of existence that I can rule this, I can handle it, this isn't going to hurt. I'm greater than the Word of God, actually, is what the decision is, and I can, uh, I can entertain this and not get hurt. That's especially true when we believe the lie from the enemy rather than the Word of God. <clears throat> because once God told Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of the garden, and uh, they both did, they exalted themselves above God's Word in earthly, carnal, sensual dominion and authority. And so that's a confidence of existence above what God told you you should be. And we become then little gods in our own decisions, uh, tromping over the top of God's word. Now, number two says the desires, the appetites, and the self-confidence are all God-given. These are all abilities to be used rightly in relationship with God and his word, but it only becomes sin when any of the three are used to break the law of God. We can take the image, the ability he's given us, and we can uh, violate uh, God's word, his laws, immediately, and then it becomes sin. Genesis 3, 6, let's go back and take a look, because this is the first time this, these three are found in the Bible, and of course it begins with the first couple. Let's start... Back in verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. And watch this temptation 
up here and watch how she dealt with it first and then what she did as a result of additional lie. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, didn't God say, that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Didn't he give you permission to eat of every tree of the garden? And of course he's quoting the word here to an extent, isn't he? He's quoting the very word God told him up to a point. But didn't God tell you you could eat of everything in the garden? And the woman who had heard the word of God given on they could eat all of the things of the garden except one, she replies, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. This is absolutely true. But, however, see, there's a condition attached by God. The woman has heard the word. She brings that condition up. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, eating, of course, would be the consummation of the lust fulfilled. The touch it would be don't get your senses involved in it. Don't even look upon the tree. Don't go near the tree. You've got all the rest of the garden. And the serpent then replies to the word that she just quoted. He says unto the woman, you shall not surely die. See, this is the lie the church has bought today worldwide. That once I'm in Christ, I can sin and I'm not going to die. Hey, these people were perfect. They had no sin record, no knowledge of sin, no memory of sin, hadn't seen sin, never heard of sin. They were absolutely the most perfect people that God could make to start the whole creation. So the serpent replies to the woman, you shall not surely die. There it is. He told you you'll die, you will not die. Well, now, that causes me a temptation already, and I've got to cast that down, or if I begin to dwell on it, I'm going to fail on that one. And this is what the church does today. They've been told they can live in sin and live in Christ, and they buy the lie, and they're dead when they buy the lie, dear friends. Because in buying the lie, this becomes their mode of life. And they not only witness this and testify this, they write letters and talk on the phone and they send emails to others telling them that's okay, that's the war of the flesh and spirit, this is the normal Christian life, we want to be free of sin till the millennium or eternity, and the lies just roll and they're dead people. I'm sorry to tell you that. If you're sitting here tonight thinking that you can be in the kingdom of God and living in one or more sins, you're totally deceived from God's word. And I had to be faced with this when I was an evangelist. I didn't know this. And I was faced with it by a person who didn't know I had that doctrine. The servant said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God doth know. Notice they're throwing it back on God. God does know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened. I guess they will. They'll be open to sin. They'll be open to direct disobedience to God. You'll be as gods, yes you will, because you will have set your own self, your own existence, higher than God. This is exactly how Satan fell. This is given to us in Ezekiel, that he set himself up over God. I will this, I will, I will, five I wills. He wanted to rise up above God in his kingdom. God knows that you'll know good and evil. So now the woman goes to the tree. That's the first mistake. First you listen to the temptation and then you go look at the thing again. And when the woman saw, here's her eyes, that the tree was good for food. Oh, I need this. I'm supposed to eat the food and this, my eyes are looking at it. That it was pleasant to the eyes. A tree to be desired to make one wise. I, I will know good and evil. She took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Total, complete, 100% disobedience on the part of both of them, right here. Let's go back to our outline. 3A, it was good for food, the appetite of the flesh, but uh, there was nothing wrong with eating food for the flesh, but God had forbade this one, therefore it was wrong. B, it was pleasant to the eyes, eyes the desire of the senses to see the beauty of it. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and finally see it could make one wise. Self-confidence of existence. God knows when I eat it, I will know all of this. 
pride of life. And there's your three right there. Now let's go over to Matthew 4 and watch Christ walk through his. The first Adam fell, the second Adam comes, and he withstands the same temptation, only perhaps in a stronger way than they did. Theirs was quite simple. Matthew 4, and we want to do probably verse 1 through 11. You need to put that on your outline there, Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Jesus, who is called the second Adam, now must be facing Satan one-on-one, -on -one, just as the first Adam did. He must be capable or have possibility of sinning if he so chooses. That's why 13 times in the New Testament it talks about the faith of Jesus Christ. There would be no way we could attribute any kind of faith to Jesus if he was just God all-powerful and wasn't subjected to temptation. But now he's in a physical body made in the likeness of sinful flesh and is going to be tested totally, completely as the first Adam was and as every human being is. So in verse 1, And Jesus was led up of the Spirit after his baptism by John in the water, baptism of the Holy Ghost. He's fully equipped. He was led into wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Specifically, this he had to go through this. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was after the hunger. And when the tempter came to him, Satan said to him, Now this is lust of the flesh. If thou be the Son of God, notice he starts it off by challenging his existence and who he is. If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, and he quotes the word of God back to the enemy here. Quoting out of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 3. Man shall not live by bread alone, for the physical body, but he must live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So he puts down the temptation for his hunger immediately by quoting the word. Yes, man can have bread, but he's not going to live by bread alone. He lives by every word. And so I realize I'm being tempted, <clears throat> and I'm not going to respond to the temptation. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city. Here's pride of life. He sets Jesus on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said unto him, If, notice he starts the challenge again with the word if. Some question, some doubt perhaps, that you think you are the son of God you may not be. You're a carpenter's son. We know your mom and dad and so forth, your brothers and sisters are with us. If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down off the pinnacle, for it is written. And now he's quoting here again from the Old Testament. And this is out of Psalms 91, 11 and 12. If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written. And Satan is quoting this. See, First time he didn't quote the word. Jesus responded by quoting it. Now Satan is even going to quote the word to Jesus. If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, He, God, shall give his angels charge concerning thee, a prophecy of them watching over Christ, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And you'd only have to go by, back and read Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12, where he's quoting from, and then see that he didn't quote the whole the whole scripture, because the next one indicted Satan as being destroyed. <laughs> and he doesn't quote that. He only quotes partial of what he wants to get across. So you got pride of life. <clears throat> Cast yourself down, prove that you're of God. The angels will catch you and fulfill the scripture and blah, blah. Verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written, again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Isn't this fantastic? Out of Deuteronomy 6:16. 6, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Then the last, third and last one, <clears throat> Satan tempts him here with the lust of the eyes. Again the devil takes them up into exceeding high mountains, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and said unto him, All these things of the kingdom will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, and once again out of Deuteronomy 6.13, it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now look, the temptation, all three, is over. The devil leaves him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. 
But the angels who were sent to protect him couldn't come until he'd made his stand. Had he given in and fallen, there was nothing they could do. He was there by free choice like the others. So the first Adam fell <clears throat> with the three temptations. Christ, the second Adam, stands. He quotes scripture, defend it, doesn't even entertain any one of the temptations that comes his way. Let's look at this, number four under Matthew, 4, 1 through 11, A. The stone and the bread, appetite of the flesh. B, showed him the kingdoms, desire of the senses, the eyes, and of course, C, get down Jesus, self-confidence of existence, the pride of life. Now let's go to Revelation 4.11. Revelation 4.11 gives us this bit of wisdom and knowledge. Thou art worthy. This is an Old Testament song being sung by the Old Testament saints. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast, past tense, created all things. And for your pleasure they are and were created. God made man for his pleasure pleasure, for his godly pleasure, not selfish, flesh, sinful pleasure, but for a godly pleasure to be able to reveal himself to mankind and work with them and uh, have them procreate into a world of people that he could be their God and fellowship with them in a right relationship. <clears throat> now, if you, A, use love this way, a love use by God's terms, gives both man and God pleasure. Because you're in love, God's in love, you're in love with God, God loves you, and all that you do is going to give God pleasure. Just as you that are married and have children and have watched them grow up, how excited you are when the children are acting in the right manner and doing the things that you've taught them, and uh, uh, you, you love them, they love you, and it's just a beautiful relationship when children are that way because you've created them and your image to uh, uh, have that kind of a relationship with you, and that's what we have with God. However, the selfish use or choice gives man, not God, pleasure. A temporal pleasure is called sin, because God said you can't do that and continue to have a love relationship with me. All right, six. Sin is defined as selfishly, deciding in favor of my appetites and my desires against the claims and conscience and God. Selfishly deciding in favor of my appetites, my desires against the claims of my conscience, which says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, you know better, and of course, God and his word. Sin happens in the spirit man. Let's go back to Mark 7.15. Sin doesn't happen in your flesh. It doesn't happen in your emotions and feelings. It happens in the spirit part of man that was made in the image of God, where we call it the heart. <clears throat> Mark seven fifteen through 23. And Jesus called all the people to him in verse 14, and he said unto them, Hearken, or listen, unto me every one of you, and understand. So he's trying to feed them some information that we're going to gain a lot from at this moment. Verse 15, there is nothing, absolutely nothing from without a man, let me just say cigarettes, drugs, booze, there isn't any object or item you can take from the outside that enters into him can defile him as a substance or drink. Now, I'm not promoting cigarettes or drugs or booze telling there's nothing outside that causes sin. The sin is caused by the choice of the individual taking something now that's going to destroy the temple of God. And God says, you are my temple. You destroy my temple and I will destroy you. So, yeah, you got a hand up back there. A spirit entering into a person is usually, most of the time, I can think of maybe one exception, comes in because of a person's sin their own sin and rejection of the will of God because uh, once you are born again and empowered of the Holy Ghost it's impossible that uh, any demon or demonic angel could enter inside of your spirit <clears throat> only through sin could they enter in or uh, doing something uh, taking drugs to defile the temple which would alter or drinking which could alter I'm only aware of one in the Bible where a man brought his son to Jesus who was tormented by a devil 
And uh, Jesus asked the man, how long has it been happening? He said, it's since a child. So we're not clear there how that uh, demon got inside of him there, but it has to come by permission and probably through something fearful that happened to him in which by his own little choice uh, allowed the thing to come in, not having any defense over it. But the, and there's no demon ability to come within you if you are in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Now just to finish that one off and go on, the church out here at large believes that a Christian can be demon-possessed as well. And they're going to tell you that the demon doesn't come into your spirit, that he comes into your flesh body. And therefore you can cast demons out of Christians, uh, out of Christians because they're Christians and you can cast them out. Friends, that's another bold lie of Satan that just absolutely defies God, uh, God's word. Now, it is not impossible that Satan would love to cohabit or dwell with a Christian, but we have to look at this from God's point of view, that he isn't going to dwell in an unclean vessel, and one being possessed by a demon is unclean. And uh, if we have to be made clean before we can be a child of God, we certainly can't have a demon within us and still be a child of God. That just doesn't wash with God. Satan may like to do it, but... God says you either is or you ain't. You cannot eat at the table of God and the table of Satan at the same time. You can't partake of both kingdoms. You can change, but you can't partake of both. So verse 15, look at it because he's headed towards a point. <clears throat> there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him or make a sinner out of him from the outside. <clears throat> But the things which come out of the man, the heart choices, the decision of the will, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples, and this is always cute to watch this, they're all standing out here like this with Jesus, you know. <laughs> I'm with him. He's doing miracles, casting out demons. I'm with him. I'm one of his disciples. Yeah. They get alone and they go right to Jesus. They don't understand, see. They go right to him. And they ask him concerning the parable that he just spoke. And he said unto them, Are you so without understanding also? It's a Greek word, stupid. Do you not perceive, don't you understand, that whatsoever thing from the outside enters into a man, it cannot defile him or make him a sinner from entering the outside in. That is not the point. It's always the heart, the choice of the will that determines what sin is. Because it enters not into his spirit man. Regardless of the drink or the drug, it doesn't go into the spirit man. But it goes into his physical belly, it goes out in the draft, purging all meats. And he said, that which comes out of the man, out of his heart, that's what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, the decision, the will, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, and murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile men. Now there's another scripture, I can't just put my hand on at this moment where it is. But it says, uh, uh, I believe it was spoken by Christ, but it doesn't make any difference. It's in the Word. It says, uh, evil thoughts come from evil hearts. But you want to stop and think that through for a minute, what that scripture is teaching us. It doesn't mean because you have an evil heart, you are now going to begin to think evil thoughts. That would just be a natural conclusion. He's telling you as soon as a good heart allows the temptation to come, and moves on it with the desire to lust after it and think on it, it then causes his heart to become sinful and it has produced a sinful thought at that moment. Doesn't mean he was had a sinful heart prior to it. It's trying to tell the man who's even the most godly person that if you're going to dwell upon this lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes of pride of life, you at the moment you're making a decision to do it rather than to cast it down and to bring all of your thoughts into captivity, 
to bring every high thing that's out there down to the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't do that, then your heart is making an evil choice at that moment, and it brings forth evil thoughts from that moment on. That's all he's saying. Okay, let's go back to this statement. Christ teaches then that sin selfishly decided in favor of appetites and desires against the claims and conscience of God comes in the spirit man only has nothing to do with the flesh of anything entering the flesh. 1 John 3, 4, another verse that will go along with this very nicely. 1 John 3, 4. This is one of the two definitions that I use of sin. We'll get to the other one down in letter D. 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever, man, woman, boy, or girl, committeth sin. Now, the commit means choice of. You don't catch it. You don't inherit it. Committeth is to make a heart decision. He commits sin. He's transgressing also the law. And I told you before, the word transgress or transgressed, transgressing, however it's used, means to have knowledge of the truth of God and to go against that truth willingly. That's the two key, key words, to have knowledge and willingly go against that truth. So anybody who's committing sin is willingly and knowingly also going against the law of God. For sin is, and here he defines it in another way, sin is the willing and knowing going against of the law. For where there is no law, of course, there can be no sin. Okay, Romans 5.13 explains that. Let's go back and see this, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Where there is no law, there could be no sin. That's why we have in the Old Testament uh, called a sin of ignorance, which had to be given to the people of Israel and anybody that came into Israel to live or to have commerce that uh, if you did not know about a particular law of Israel and you violated it, they would take you anyway to the priest and you would have to make an offering for that sin because that was a sin in the eyes of the other people. You may not have known the law, but they would explain it to you. You'd go and make it. It's called a sin of ignorance. Did not know that there was a civil law such or a ceremonial law, whatever, covering this and when they pointed it out to you, you had to make an offering. But in the New Testament, now that people can be born again back there, all people, even the saints, had sin dwelling in their conscience, had no way of removing the sin through blood, blood of bulls and goats. The sin could only cover the sin could only be covered with the blood of the animals. But now in the New Testament, since Christ has come, and we are either totally a sinner 100 percent or totally a saint 100 percent, there is no room anymore from God's point of view, for ignorance uh, in that sense. You're either sinning or you're not sinning because Christ has made it possible now that we have a clear-cut avenue between sin and righteousness. So Romans 5.13 tells us, For until the law, sin was in the world. Until the Old Testament law through Israel came, sin was in the world from Adam and Eve on, and we can read about all the people that sinned, but sin is not imputed. It's not accredited to anybody or accounted to anybody where there is no law. And he's writing, of course, to the church at Rome, which has many <clears throat> born-again, spirit-filled Jews in it. And he keeps bringing information up that's necessary for them that uh, there is no law in the New Testament, then there is no sin. If you have a knowledge of the law, then you have sin. Uh, Paul deals with this going on in Romans 14 about a weak brother who is unable to eat meat. He's eating vegetables and you're eating meat. And it calls that a weak conscience or a weak faith. Instead of ignorance, it's called weak because he has not yet, since he's been saved or filled with the Holy Ghost, he has not been yet taught that he is free to eat all manner of meat uh, with thanksgiving to God, that all things are, are good and acceptable in God's sight. So instead of calling it the sin of ignorance, he tells you the man is weak. He hasn't got to that place yet. It's not in his conscience. He's been taught under the Jewish law. He couldn't eat certain meats, and uh, 
wear a certain kind of clothing and do this, that, and the other, and that's all wiped away by the liberty of the grace of Jesus Christ. And so he tells us very clearly that it's just a weak brother now who is not up to par. But we understand also, and this comes from Romans 2, 14 and 15, that the Gentiles, which did not have the written moral law as Israel did, are doing many of the things that are contained in the moral law, which shows then that the Gentiles are a law unto themselves, that God can judge them. And where is that coming from? They're God conscious. They're obeying many of the things that are in the moral law, but they don't have it in writing, but their conscience has them. And it goes on to say in verse 15, uh, 2.15, that uh, this proves then that the law of God is written in the conscience of every man. They have it. And as you grow up, there that law is. And that's how Paul said in uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 9, that he was uh, alive once or free from sin. And it must have been when he was a small then he goes on to say, and, but the law came, when the law came, and he understood the law, sin revived, or the word, the Greek word there is made alive within me. Sin came, and he said, I died spiritually, somewhere as a young man. When he began to be taught and worked under the Jewish system of getting these laws placed within him, and uh, he was free once without it. The law came, and then he knew it, and then he died. Sin revived, came alive. James 4.17, we will not turn there. That merely says, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not unto him it is sin. And that's God's definition of sin throughout the entire Bible. Three, the war of the flesh and spirit. We've got to get down to that because that's the title of the whole teaching. We want to understand thoroughly what it is because of the lie that's out here today about that same statement. A, until sin is removed by the blood of Jesus Christ... Sin predominates. It predominates in our conscience or consciousness. Let's go over to Romans or Hebrews 10. We've been here. This is a verse to kick it off to walk through what we want to walk through on this area. Romans or excuse me, Hebrews 10, 1 through 4. I love both Romans and Hebrews. That's why when we do two New Testament survey after we finish the four Gospels in the book of Acts, we move into Romans and then we go right to Hebrews. These are two books that must be studied back to back. And I love them so, and I quite often get them confused when I'm uh, teaching. Okay, Hebrews 10, 1 through 4, for the law, the Old Testament law, having a shadow, a type, a sign, a figure, an example of the good spiritual things to come. And the law was not the very image of those things. It was in the natural, and God's law was spiritual. So it wasn't the very image of the spiritual things. The law can never, with those animal sacrifices, which they offered year by year, <coughs> it can never continually make the comers thereunto perfect or spiritual. For then, if they could make them spiritually perfect, would they not have ceased to be offered? Yes, if you could find a sacrifice by an animal that could remove the blood, <coughs> the sin from the man, not the blood, but remove his sin from him, then you would not have to have another offering. You've already got an offering that can do it. For they would have ceased to be offered if you could have found a perfect Old Testament offering. But... Because that the worshipers, once they were made clean or washed, should have no more conscience of sin. They'd have no more accountability or record to God of having any sin if it could be removed. But in those animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, there's a remembrance, again, made of sins every year. And this was the Day of Atonement, one of the three great major feasts, all of Israel. They killed the animal and sacrificed it, and everybody had to bubble up and confess and remember all their sins from the previous year. And every year they had to go through the same thing again and again and again, which showed that the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it. But that's what verse 4 says. The Old Testament sacrifices should take away sins. It only covered, or the word was kephar, it covered the sins so that God could have a salvation relationship with those who were obedient to the Old Testament law. Then Hebrews 9.9, 9, backing up one chapter, and we'll do verse 14 as well. Talking about verse 8, the Holy Ghost thus signifying 
that the way and the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. As long as the tabernacle was still standing, the Holy Ghost showed that the entrance way directly or personally to God was not made perfect, that there was no way to go directly to God. You had to go to the high priest through the sacrifice. While the first tabernacle was yet standing. Which, the tabernacle was a type for the time then present for Israel for 1,500 years in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. What about the gifts and sacrifices that could not make him the high priest that did the service spiritually perfect as pertaining to his conscience? Why? Well, we already found that out in 10.4. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't wash or make clean the conscience from sin. Verse 14. Talking about in 13, the blood of bulls and goats sanctifying to the purifying of the flesh, that is to allowing God to have a salvation relationship with them through the offering that covered the sin. Verse 14, compared to that, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Holy Spirit he offered himself? Number one, without spot. Main thing to remember, number one, he offers himself without sin to God. How much more then, because he was free of sin and offered himself, will he purge or wash or cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hebrews 10, 22. Because now of Jesus Christ, our high priest, and Christ was our offering, having become both a high priest and the offering, and went back to heaven as such to present himself to the Father as the high priest and the offering, let us draw near now with a true heart, a clean, absolutely pure heart, and full assurance of faith, having our hearts, the spirit man, the conscience, washed, it's sprinkled, because that's what the priest did with the blood, and he's dealing here in Hebrews with the born-again, spirit-filled Jews, having our hearts sprinkled, or we would say washed, or cleansed from an evil conscience, and our bodies, the old man, the sinful nature we created, washed with pure water. The word of God. And then Isaiah 5, 1 through 10. Isaiah, by the unction of the Holy Ghost, gives us a story of what God has done, and it refers to the nation of Israel, and it takes a little time to get into it, but look what he's headed for. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, beloved touching this vineyard, Israel. My well-beloved God hath made a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. This nation is called a vineyard. God fenced it in, protected it, walled it, gathered out of the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, built a tower in the midst of it, also made a wine press therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray thee, betwixt me and my vineyard. Here's the question that he asked them. What could have been done more to my vineyard than I have done in it? Short of causation or force, what more could I have done to raise a nation up, which ultimately he wants to reach the world with? What more could I have done? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard, Israel. I'm going to take away the hedge thereof, it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. I will lay it to waste, it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up, up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but withhold a cry. But behold, a cry. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ears, saith the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair without inhabitants. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of a homer shall yield an epoch. And he goes on with the woes, which is the word curse. And now let's just go down to verse 13. You need to add this in on your outline. Verse 13, Therefore my people are gone into captivity. 
Why? Because they have no knowledge. Why? Because of their choice. It isn't that the word wasn't there. It wasn't that the priest didn't preach it and teach it. People weren't obeying it. They have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished. Their multitudes are dried up with thirst of righteousness. They don't want it. God says, what more could I have done? And so there it is. The curse upon Israel that remained. Israel split in two. The northern kingdom, ten tribes, called Israel. Southern tribe, Judah, Benjamin. And he had Assyria come in finally and wipe out those ten tribes. You see, even though God wanted the nation that would reach the world, he could not work with the evil part of it, and they divided away from the godly, and then the godly part became ungodly as well, and God just preserved that Judah long enough for Christ to come and try to confirm or to make stand or put in motion the new covenant to them, and they refused him. He came to Zohar and they received him not. Now he goes to be and begins to develop this. The war starts when sin is committed and it's not removed. That's when the war of the flesh and spirit which are given to us begins. Sin is committed, it's not removed. You got a war because you know the truth, you're not obeying it, you're in a state of sin, you're there by choice, and you're not coming out of the sin at that moment, so you got a war going on. If you confessed it and got out of it, you wouldn't have a war. That sin and the guilt of that sin predominate in the consciousness, making it difficult, making it difficult, not impossible, but difficult to choose the right the next time. Every sin makes it thus more difficult to make the right choice. If you don't come back, you'll be adding other sins and you begin to build up habits of a sinful choice. All right, remaining sin and guilt browbeats, it condemns present existence of sin in the consciousness begin the law of habit number one Romans 7 5 let's read this because Paul beautifully explains this and then we'll work on some of the other points that go along with this Romans 7 5 Paul trying to explain sin to the church at Rome because again he's got a pocket or center group of born-again spiritual Jews there that he's got to be very strong and how he works them plus the rest of them are Gentiles that have had no training for when we were in the flesh the flesh means the unregenerate state Romans 7 5 didn't mean when we were in a flesh body because he's writing it while he's in a flesh body and he's writing it to people that are in a flesh body so it says when we were past tense in an unregenerate state the motions of sin, the feelings, the memory, the thoughts, the imagination, the habits of sins which were by the law did work in our members, all of that in the conscience to bring forth fruit unto death over and over and over again. All right, motions in the Greek is the Greek word pathema, means influence of experiences undergone, previous, past, undergone experience. Motions of sin, the old man's sinful nature are all terms used by Paul, not sinful nature, but we call that today. He calls it the old man, the motion of sins. Now let's go back to Romans 7, where we are in 14, and I want to walk through this again, because this all has to do with sin. And we need to see what it's like. And I told you in verse 9, let's look at verse 9, it's not in your sheet, but look at it, Romans 7, 9. For Paul said, I was alive without the law once. Sometime in the past, I was free of the condemnation of the law as a child. <clears throat> because as an adult you could never be free from the law of condemnation because you couldn't get rid of your sin couldn't be washed out blood, blood of bulls and goats so I was alive one time without the law but when this commandment came when I began to learn the law know the law sin revived came alive and I died so he tells you there how he went from no sin into sin as a child now he's going to him, a Pharisee serving the law of God, what it was like in the Old Testament life. Verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual. It's for guiding the inner man. But I'm carnal, 
carnal has one meaning to it, sarax means unregenerate. The word flesh is the same word sarax, but that has two meanings, a physical body or an unregenerated person. Carnal means unregenerated. I'm unregenerated, I'm sold under sin. I sold myself by choice under sin. I wasn't sold by the first Adam. I sold myself. And a good reference to put right by the word soul is 2 Kings 17:17, 17, 17, which tells you how the Israelites sold themselves to sin. That's where he's pulling that from for the Jew. For that which I do, and this means by the choice of his will, I allow not in my mind. I know better from the law. Yes. Second Kings 17:17. Uh, 17, 17. He's using the illustration here for the Jew that's over there about the Jews selling themselves under the bondage to other nations. But he's likening that unto sin. You sell yourself unto sin like they sold themselves out to the other nations. Verse 15. For that which I am doing by the choice of my will, I allow not in my mind got a war going on he knows the truth of God but he's not keeping it for what I would in my mind that I do not with my choice of my will but what I hate in my mind through the knowledge I have of God that I keep doing see if then I do that if I'm doing that by choice which I would not in my mind in my memory I consent under the law that it's good I'm, I'm just verifying the fact the law is good because my conscience is pricked I'm guilty and yet I'm not keeping it but I know it's there so I'm verifying the law of God is good verse 17 now then as he goes on he says it's no more I of course it's him but he's trying to tell you what he's doing we would call this he is building himself a sinful nature the motions of sin the old man the habits it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Yes, every time he sins, it keeps adding on. He has no way to wash or deliver himself from that sin. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, unregenerate state, dwelleth no good thing, no spiritual thing. For to will, how to choose, is present with me, but how to perform that free of sin which is good spiritually I don't find and of course you couldn't find it under the Old Testament for the good that I would I know I should be doing with the law I'm not doing by choice that doesn't mean every time he just means he keeps failing there's no freedom from sin but the evil which I would not I know I shouldn't be doing these things the Bible says thou shalt not thou shalt not I keep doing it now, if I do that, that I would not, if I'm willing to go ahead and do something that I wouldn't do in my mind because I know it, it's no more I that do it. See, he says it the second time. It's emotions of sin, the old man we call the sinful nature. It's the sin that dwelleth in me that I can't get rid of. I find then a law that when I would do good because I know it in my mind, <clears throat> evil is present with me. I guess so. I've sinned, sinned, and there it is in my memory, my conscience. Then he says in 22, I delight in the law, the Old Testament law of God, after the inward man. That is, in my mind, my spirit mind, I delight in the law. It's great. It's good. I find nothing wrong with it. But he says, I'm beginning to see. Now he's writing here from his point of view. He's already saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. He comes back and says, I see another law in my members. We call it sinful nature. Warring against the law of my mind. So here's the war against the knowledge that he has, against what he's doing with it. This is the warfare. Brings me into captivity the law of sin, which is in my members, my spirit. Now he says, O oh, wretched, miserable man that I am in this state, before he found Christ, of course, who shall deliver me from this body, the old man, the motions of sin, the sinful nature, who will deliver me from this spiritual death? He tells you, verse 25, I thank God that it's through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is why he came. So then, he reverts back to what he was saying before, with my mind under the law, I am serving the law of God. <clears throat> this was great, it's wonderful, but with the flesh, the unregenerate nature, I was serving the law of sin. I couldn't get free of it. Now he takes us over into 
Romans 8 and begins to write to them. Now he's told us what he was like as a child, how he fell into sin, what he was like under the law. Now he's going to write to us what it's like when the Redeemer, Christ, comes. Chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now, because of Jesus Christ, no condemnation, no warfare, there is no law or conscience to them that are in Christ Jesus who are no longer walking after the flesh, the unregenerated person, but they're now walking after the Spirit. We've been born again. We've been cleansed by the Spirit. We're filled with the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free. <clears throat> I was washed, something the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do, Hebrews 10.4. I'm made free from the law of sin and death. For what the Old Testament law could not do in that it was weak, only spiritually. See, it couldn't clean the sin out, so it was weak only in that sense. It wasn't weak to be ineffective. It was the best God could do for them, not being able to regenerate them yet. For what the Old Testament law could not do, then it was weak through dealing with the flesh or the unregenerate man. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Didn't say he came as a sinner. He came in the likeness, image of those who are in an unregenerate state. And he comes for sin, Hooper. He comes to be a substitute for us in place of it instead on our behalf. Condemning sin, when he comes and dies, he condemns all sin then in the flesh or in an unregenerate person. They're all condemned because they don't have to stay there. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Us who? Who are no longer walking after the unregenerate flesh nature, but we're walking after the spirit relationship with God. Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh, the unregenerate nature, they do mind. They pay attention to and follow the things of the unregenerate world. But they that are after the Spirit, we're following the things of the Holy Spirit that he's revealing. For to be carnally minded, carnally unregenerate minded is spiritual death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Why? Because the carnal mind, the unregenerate spirit mind, is enmity or hatred against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. The carnal, unregenerate person is always, at every moment that they're unregenerated, they are in a state of rebellion against God. And you need to write the word rebellion somewhere in your notes or in the scripture. Anybody who's in a state of one or more sin is in a state of rebellion against God's program of living free of sin. You have to remember, when you choose to sin, you're choosing to be a rebel against God, knowingly. So then, verse 8, they that are in the unregenerate state cannot ever, never, never please God. No matter how big a church they pastor, how big a Bible teacher, how big an apostle or a prophet, whatever they think they are, they'll never please God. They've got a form, they can speak, they memorize a word, they don't please God. But he says to the church in Rome, you are not in the flesh, you're not in the unregenerate. Of course they're in flesh bodies, but that isn't how he uses the word. You're not in the unregenerate state, but you're in the spirit if... You're in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in relationship with you, not inside of you. When we're born again, we don't receive the Spirit of God inside of us. It is our spirit that is born again and becomes one spirit with God. So the word in is relationship, not inside of. Only when we're baptized with the Holy Ghost does he come to live within us. But that doesn't save us. That happens only after you're saved. But you're not in the unregenerate state, but in the Spirit, if so be, that the Spirit of God dwells in a relationship with you. Now, if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, that is, he has not been born again, his Spirit has not been made one with Christ so that he can be one with God, he is none of his. And if Christ be in a relationship with you, the old man, the motions of sin, the sinful nature is dead because of sin. 
But the spirit is now life or alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of God that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in relationship with you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal, your physical bodies. How? By his spirit that dwelleth in relationship with you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the old flesh unregenerate life to live after the old unregenerate life. For if you live after the flesh, the unregenerate life, you shall die spiritually, eternally. But if through the Holy Spirit you do mortify, now this word mortify in the Greek is to put to death. It isn't to let sin coexist with us or some sin be in us. We must mortify or put to death the deeds of the old man of the flesh nature if you do that you'll live you cannot live with one or more sin in you and this is kind of the summary of it for as many whoever they are as many as are led not caused or forced or pushed they're led by the spirit of God they and they only are the sons of God and that's anybody who's born again is now being led by the spirit of God and the Holy Spirit, once he's born again, will lead him into receiving the Holy Ghost, who then will begin to lead, teach, and guide you even deeper at that moment. On page 14, under B, the war starts when sin is committed and it's not removed. That sin and the guilt of that sin predominate in the conscience, making it difficult to choose the right the next time. Remaining sin and guilt spiritually browbeats and condemns. Present existence of sin in consciousness begins the law of habit. One sin is not taken care of, I will do two sins. I will do three, I'm now in a habit. Doesn't mean that I can't do some good things in between, but I'm building up a sinful nature, the motions of sin, until that's confessed and repented of, I'm accumulating sin in my consciousness. Point number three, we want to go to Galatians 5, 13 through 25. Paul's main theme here is dealing with the church in Galatia that's been caught up in some Jewish influence, born again, probably spirit-filled Jews that have come to the church in Galatia and said, you guys are doing great, but you need to keep some of these laws that God gave us in the Old Testament. And so the church in Galatia began to pick up a whole new doctrine, a whole new gospel. So in Galatians 5.13, Paul says, For brethren, you have been, past tense, called into liberty, the grace and freedom of God's new covenant, free of sin. Only use not this freedom, this sin-free life or liberty for an occasion to the flesh to go back and fulfill the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or pride of life. Because you've been set free, don't think now you can go back and be in sin and you're still in God. This is what the church does. But by agape, godly love, serve one another. For all of the Old Testament law morally is fulfilled in one word, even into this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. <clears throat> that can only be done if you love God. You love God with all your heart, strength, mind, soul, body, and you love your neighbor as yourself. On that, all the moral commandments are built. Envy and strife, backbiting and so forth, you'll consume one another in that sin. This I say then, that if you're walking, if you're making progress and maturity in the spirit life, you cannot, you shall not, it is impossible to fulfill the lust of the flesh at the same time. This is why the positive thing is to cast down the imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and to bring every one of our thoughts in obedience to Christ Jesus that God has made a way of escape, that no matter what the temptation that comes, there is a way of escape, and that is our choice to cast it down and to move on. So we're going to walk in the Spirit. We're in Detroit. We cannot be in Chicago at the same time. We can change positions and go to Chicago, but we can't be in Chicago and Detroit at the same time. So if we're walking or fulfilling maturity in the Spirit life, we cannot at the same time be unregenerate. For the flesh, the unregenerate nature, lusts against the things of the spirit, which the conscience knows those things of the spirit. 
and the spirit, the knowledge that they have, lusts against the unregenerate nature, and these are contrary. They're two different lives to one another so that you cannot do the things that you would. And that's what Paul just got through telling us back in Romans 7. The things I know I ought to be doing, I don't do. The things I know I shouldn't be doing, I keep doing. O oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this kind of a religious life? I thank God Jesus Christ. <clears throat> 18, but if you be led, and there's the key, the word if, if you permit, if you choose to be led by the Spirit, you cannot at the same time be under the law. The Holy Spirit has been given to us to be placed within us after salvation that the Holy Ghost might lead us into all truth, guide us into all truth, and teach us all truth. And if we are being led by him to obey the truth that we have, we will not be under the condemnation of the law. We will not be producing the sin that the law is going to trap us. Now the works of the flesh, the unregenerate person, are manifest, which are these. And he names some. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Now lasciviousness means to excite to sexual pleasure one way or another. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations or jealousies, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like things, the list, of the which I tell you before, I've already told you before, so I have also told you in time past again, that they which are doing these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But, contrast, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life, developing the Spirit life, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, meekness, and temperance. If you are growing that kind of fruit, there is no law that you are going to be under. Against such, the growing of the nine fruit of the Spirit, there is no law to condemn you because you are not going the way of the flesh. And they that are Christ, through our confession, repentance, acknowledging Christ as our Lord and Savior, being filled and following Him, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh, the old man, the sinful nature, with all of its affections, its lust, emotions, and feelings. That's why Jesus said to one of the would-be disciples, Go and sell all that you have, give it to the poor, take up your cross and follow me. Well, what's the purpose of a cross like this one man does, drags it all over the world on beaches talking to people? No, the cross was something to die upon. It isn't something you wear around your neck. I don't care if you wear it, but it isn't something you demonstrate or hang on the wall. The cross is something you die on that rids you in that sense that you are crucified with Christ as he was. You have crucified your life, allowed it to die, and that stuff is gone. So then, 25, if, here's choice again, if we're living in the spirit life, being led, as we saw previously, of the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. If we've got the life, we say we're born again, we say we're free of sin, we say we're baptized, then walk in it. Make your maturity in it that way. Galatians 6, 8. For he, any man, woman, boy, or girl that sows in his life, his choices, his decisions, his thinking, his imaginations, he sows to his flesh the unregenerate nature, shall of the unregenerate nature reap corruption in his life. But he that so spends his times and energy that the things of the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. James 4, 1 through 8. James 4, 1. James, the half-brother of Christ, writing under the unction of the Holy Ghost, writes to the church and says, From whence or where come wars and fightings among you born-again Christians? He's not writing to the world. The book of Romans, the book of Acts, and everything on from that is written to the godly saints. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John can be read by the world and understood and get saved by it. So he's writing to the church, From where, whence, comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. That war in your members, in your mind, in your imagination, your conscience, your memory. 
selfish desires. You lust and you have not. You kill or you envy. You desire to have. You cannot obtain. You fight and you war, yet you have not. Why? Because you ask not. You're not asking God for his life, his victories, and his provision spiritually, physically, and materially. You ask in that sense, but you're not receiving. Why? Because you're asking it amiss. What do you mean? You're asking that you may still consume it in your state of lust. Instead of being in the Spirit, working with God, you're refusing to come clean with God, and you're still asking and begging and praying for the things and the comforts of the world, and you're not getting it because you're asking the wrong way. You're asking it apart from the relationship. You're in one or more sin. But see, this is the whole church. And you hear it all the time. Why did God do this? Why did God do this? Why didn't God do this? Why did, when people start saying that, friends, you right away know immediately. And I've been to this stage as well as anybody else. But as soon as you start asking it, you realize you're not in a position to receive. You want it, but without the change. You want it without the conforming to the image of Christ. You want it without being led to the Spirit. That's how he gives it. He says now to the church, you adulterers, spiritually, adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of and with the world is enmity or hatred with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, and the temptations three then he will flee from you four draw nigh to God five he will draw nigh to you six cleanse your filthy dirty sinful hands you sinners this is written to Christians you sinners that are pretending you're saved seven or six or cleanse uh, see five draw nigh to you he'll draw nigh to you <coughs> um, Six, cleanse your hands, you sinners. And seven, purify your hearts. Keep it clean with the Word and the Spirit. You double-minded. See, they, they've got a form, but they're not following it. Verse 9, which is point number 8. Be afflicted, mourn, and weep. 9, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joint to heaviness. 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And 11, he will lift you up. Verse 11, which is point 12, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and he judges his brother, heart, speaketh evil of the law, and judges the law. But if thou judgest the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Let's go over to chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, two of my favorite verses. Written to the church, written to believers. The half-brother of Christ by the Holy Ghost, verse 19, says, Brethren, if, choice, any of you do err or sin away from God's truth, if anybody does, and notice now, one convert him or brings him back into the kingdom of God. Because if he has one sin, he's got to be converted spiritually back. One sin, he loses the spirit by choice. He chooses to go with the devil. He must be converted. Let him know that he which converts the sinner. Notice he says a brother who errs or sins must be converted. And you're converting the sinner back to God. You're not dealing with a carnal Christian. You're dealing with a Christian who was a Christian. He is now a sinner. He converts the sinner from the error or the sin of his way. He will save a soul or that individual from spiritual eternal death and he will hide by his confession repentance under the blood of Christ through 1 John 1 a multitude of sin. Romans 6.6 6. Uh, Paul really brings out the sinful nature of the old man or motions of sin. In Romans 6.6 6, Knowing this, that our old man, the sinful nature the motions of sin, the habits of sin, is crucified with Christ. If you come to Christ, that man is dead, he's gone forever. 
that the body of sin, the old man, the sinful nature, might be destroyed, as far as God is concerned, never to be remembered or brought up again of that sin and that time, that henceforth we should not or never again serve sin and have that dominion of it over us. Ephesians 4.21 If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him, Jesus Christ, you've heard him, you've been taught by him, as the truth is in Christ. Christ is truth. He said, I am the truth, not a truth. I am the truth. If you have been taught by him, as the truth is in Christ, that you, the church at Ephesus, you put off choice. You put off concerning the former conversation, the Greek word behavior. Put off is by choice. The former conversation, behavior, put off the old man, the motions of sin, the sinful nature, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. And be ye renewed, how? In the spirit of your mind. You can be born again spiritually, but you've got to renew the whole mind, the whole thinking process, your whole standard, your whole method, your way of life must be taught, trained, and renewed. And this is the job of the Holy Ghost. This is why Christ commands in Acts 1, 4, and 5 that we be baptized with the Holy Ghost so the Holy Ghost can begin to do his work in the baby, to the child, to the young man, to the father. So we're to put off the old man in verse 24 that you put on something else. You put on the new man, the divine nature, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The new man doesn't have any unrighteousness. He doesn't have any unholiness in him. If he's a new man, he's holy, perfect, and righteous. If he sins, he's lost that at that moment. Colossians 3, 5 through 10. 3, 5 starts out with the word mortify again, which means to put to death. Let it die spiritually. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, your mind, your imagination, your thinking process, your memory. You've got to control it. Mortify. Put to death your members which are upon this earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. Children of disobedience are those who are choosing to stay in a state of sin. In the which you also walked some time in the past, when you lived in those kind of things. But now you also put off. You, you, you at Colossae, you're supposedly born again. Your old sins are gone. The old man's gone. You're born again. You're a new creature. You've been baptized with the Holy Ghost. And some of you are still playing with these things. Put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. He's talking to Christians at the church. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have, past tense, put off the old man, the sinful nature, with his deeds. That's a personal choice. And you have, past tense, put on the new man, the divine man, which is renewed in knowledge, constantly with truth, growing. He's renewed after the image of Jesus Christ that created him, or God that created him. All right? <clears throat> Let's then move off of here to C, point C. Thus, there is no war between the flesh, the unregenerate person, and the spirit taught in the Bible. That is, we use the word body here because many people think, and I want to make this clear, that sin is in the physical body. That the spirit man's okay with God, but his, his body is the one that's robbing cars and banks and killing people and taking drugs and drinking, but his spirit is okay with God. That, that's almost common knowledge around the world right now. The sin somehow is in the flesh body. So we're saying, thus there is no war between the flesh body and the spirit taught in the Bible. The war is between unremoved sin and the other flesh word, unregenerated spirit, the law of sin, and the consciousness, the God consciousness that he has knowing the truth and the rules of God. That's where the war is. So if you're free of sin... There is no war. If you commit one sin, there's now a war going on between 
the truth you know and the fact that your spirit is in an unregenerate state but the spirit of God has the truth of it and you've got a war going on here between the unregenerate flesh spirit and the spirit of God that's in the truth within you. D. We must keep the old man of sin crucified. I say carry a shovel every time he tries to climb up out of the grave just hit him. Boom! You're dead. Keep the old man of sin crucified and put on Jesus Christ. Let's go over to Romans 13 and work on some of these verses. 13.8 You've got to keep the old man down and dead. Buried. You don't let him up for a weekend or a night. You keep him dead. Romans 13.8 Owe no man anything. And the word owe there means without intent to pay. But this is what we do owe, but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled, or is fulfilling, all the requirements of God. Verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love does not project any wrath, envy, strife to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the moral law. Verse 13 and 14. Let us walk honestly as in the day. <clears throat> of the appearance of Christ. Not in rioting and drunkenness. Mind you, they're having to write this to the church. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in clambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put you on choice. The Lord Jesus Christ, His Spirit, His life, and make not choice. Do not make any provisions for an unregenerate life to fulfill the lusts thereof of an unregenerate person. Don't do it. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4. <coughs> Writing to the church at Corinth. We've got problems. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. And brethren, I, brethren, Paul says, I could not speak unto you as spiritual people. Now, oh, that wasn't that they were all unsaved and fallen back because there evidently was some, because he can call them brethren. But he's writing to, it seems, the problems in the multitude of the church. I could not speak to you as being spiritual, but as being carnal. And the word carnal, again, is sarax. It only has one meaning. When it's sarax, carnal means unregenerate. I have to write unto you as unregenerate, even as unto babes in Christ. He didn't say as babes. As unto means you were like a baby in Christ, but you've fallen away. You're back to that stage, only you're in a state of sin. I have, past tense, fed you with the easy word of God, the milk, and not with the meat, the heavy doctrine. For hitherto, prior to this, you're not able to bear meat, neither yet now, when I'm writing this, are you able to bear the strong meat of the word. Why? Verse 3, for you are yet carnal, unregenerate. For whereas there is among you, <clears throat> now listen to this, envying, strife, divisions, schisms, are you not unregenerate, carnal, and you're walking as flesh men without God. For while one says, I'm Paul, another says, I'm Apollos, are you not yet carnal? Either you're of Christ or you're not. And here they're running around giving allegiance to men and pyramid leadership over them as if they were God. 1 Corinthians 1, 11 through 13. Uh, hits some of the problem over here. 1 Corinthians 1, 11, For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Shame, shame, shame. A church body with contentions. Now this I say, that every one of you is either running around saying, I'm a Paul, or another one group says, I'm a Paulus, or some say of Cephas, and other groups rightly so say, I'm of Christ. As long as you do that, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? See? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I guess not. 1 Corinthians 9.27 We've got to keep the old man down or you get back like these churches that he's writing to, they keep popping back into sin. Paul, in writing to the church of Corinth, makes a statement about himself that he faces the same thing they do. We all do. 
But I keep by choice my body and bring it into subjection and the lust thereof. Lest that by any means when I have gone all over the world and Concordance, Greek number 96, unapproved and worthless. People try to make all kinds of statements by the word castaway. Well, yeah, everybody's still saved. No, the word is unapproved or worthless to God. No value whatsoever. 2 Corinthians 7 1. And all these problems are popping up in the middle of these churches and haven't been dealt with. Now, you notice God allowed by the Holy Ghost all these problems to be written for our benefit today. That in every body of Christ, every church, there's going to be problems. That shouldn't be so, but there's going to be some, and you need to understand this is common, but it needs to be worked on. It doesn't have to be that way. That's what will happen to it, unless the people stay. The pastor can't cause you. 2 Corinthians 7, one. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved of God... Let us, something we have to do, cleanse ourselves. It isn't God. It isn't the Holy Ghost. It isn't the blood of Jesus Christ like a great windshield wiper or whopping our sins away as fast as we commit them. We have to cleanse ourselves from what? All filthiness of the flesh or unregenerate nature and spirit. We have to, by choice, perfect holiness in the fear or obedience of the love relationship with God. Second Timothy 2.22. Timothy writing to the church, or Paul writing to Timothy, who is to take this to the various cities and churches. And here's what he writes to Timothy. Flee also youthful lusts. Lusts that start in our teenage years of lusting for sex and lusting now today for drugs and other recognitions. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness faith, charity, which is love, peace, with all the rest of them that call on the Lord. And how do they call on him? Out of a pure heart. No war of the flesh and spirit. It's a pure, clean heart. Titus 2, 11 and 12, right after 2 Timothy. Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God that brings God's salvation has appeared to all men. That is, in the first coming, Christ came and revealed God's total and complete plan to redeem men back from a life of sin. That's already been given to us through Jesus Christ. Teaching us that denying, by our choice, ungodliness, denying the worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, which no Christian today believes you can be righteous, holy, or perfect, except those few who believe the word, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. It isn't set aside for a millennium, a thousand years, or eternity. We are to be holy, perfect, and righteous now. And then back to Mark 8, 34 and 35. Christ is talking here about four verses. We'll cover a couple of them about self-denial, denying self, the lust thereof, and the wishes and desires. In Mark 8, 34, And when Jesus had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever, anybody that will come after me, wants to be joined with me, let him by his choice deny himself or his selfish desires or his lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and pride of life. That's something we have to do. God can't do it for us. We have the power. Deny himself, take up his cross, and a cross, again, the only purpose of it is to die on it to the selfishness. And follow me. For whosoever, anybody in the world that wants to save his life on his own, he will lose it. Any other method, any other religion, any other way, he'll lose it in the end. But whosoever shall lose or give away his life for my sake, lose the old man. For my sake and the gospels, the same shall ultimately, eternally save that life. <clears throat> now some comments here about the war of the flesh and spirit as we come to the end of it. 
The false doctrine, and it's just about all over the world in every church, and I've been in 49 countries, I've seen it all over the world. The false doctrine that men, saved or unsaved, have a dual nature. And this is believed by the Calvinist. The men have a dual nature, or part godly and part evil. The part that's godly is saved, that's going to go to heaven. Uh, a fellow one time, and I showed this to Karen, he, he has Bible schools just like I do here in Michigan. He has them out on the East Coast. And somehow, I have no idea at this moment how I got connected with some of his teaching. But this man took this doctrine and drove it to the ultimate point. Part of me is good, part of me is evil. The part that's good, that's going to save me. And he took this and developed it out, and I read it, and I showed it to Karen, we both laughed. When you die, your good spirit goes to heaven to be with God, and the bad soul that sinned goes to hell to be tormented. So two parts of you go to two different places. One is having a good time, the other is being tormented. <coughs> now that's stupid and funny, but he took it right off the doctrine that's in most of the churches all over the world. Part of us is good, part's bad. He had to reckon then when you died, part of you went to torment and part of you went to heaven. Yes, it does. The whole church is living that way. Sister Reed, isn't it? First time guest tonight? The Adamic nature. Yeah. You got it handed down from Adam and that thing is going to go and be tormented forever. So you might be in heaven going, hallelujah, ooh, ooh, ah, oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord, ooh, ah. <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> Just a thought. The false doctrine that men saved or unsaved have a dual nature, a godly nature and a damning nature, sets the stage for other like doctrines, none of which find their basis in the word of God or the work of God, but rather in books and writings of unregenerate, unregenerate psychologists who were not being led by the Holy Spirit to discern God's eternal truth. So let's walk through some five points here. Number one, we've got a dual nature in a Christian. Inherent good in one part of me and inherent evil drives in the other part. Two, this inevitable war between good and evil forces, a war of the flesh and of the spirit, and they just love this. Three, that one may dwell in sin and in Christ both, the saints washed in the blood and then part of him is a sinner. For one may possess both the Holy Spirit and demons. Casting demons out of Christians, one of the most popular ministries in the United States today. Hundreds of books are written on it. People fly from all over the world to come to these seminars. They get demons cast out of them, but they, they, they want the demons of tobacco, the demons of drink, the demons of drugs, and every other demon cast out of them. And they go out of a meeting and testify they really felt good. In two or three weeks, however, the demon is back. And eventually, when you confess you had a demon, you will get a demon the next time. Five, ultimately, this ultimately leads to schizophrenic beliefs, belief that one possesses two inherent forces or personalities in opposition one to another, and that's what the whole teaching of the war in flesh and spirit ultimately will do for anybody that believes you have that dual nature within you, part good and part bad. Satan loves it. He and his demons roll on the floor laughing when it's preached in churches. Page 15, Problems with the Dual Nature Doctrine. The question is asked, how can I have the peace of God if there is a war going on in me? Now let's go back and check out the Old Testament prophecies on this. Isaiah, how have you sinned if you didn't sin? But I mean, I didn't know I sinned. Well, you, that's not sin then. Sin is always knowable. He that knoweth to do good and chooses not to do the good, that's sin. You can't sin accidentally or innocently. Sin is always knowable by God's definition. Those are good questions, Chuck. Those are things that every one of us have to come to grip with because we've been taught, yeah, we have been taught contrary that we can sin through ignorance or innocence and that's not God's definition in the New Testament. All of his definitions, James 4, 17, 1 John 4, 3, three, four, and all the rest of the teachings have to do with the fact we know the truth and we choose to go against it. That's what constitutes sin. Nothing else in the New Testament. 
So there's no such thing as not knowing I've sinned. And I've tried to help hundreds and hundreds of people with that in my lifetime. We've already covered that. The war comes the moment you commit one sin. Then you've got a war between your conscience and the will and the mind. And you are now in a state of sin and a state of guilt and a state of condemnation. One sin puts you into that. Where there's no sin, there has to be peace. That's the whole purpose of Christ's coming was to remove all sin and give us the peace, which Paul tells you in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 26, that he had no peace. He was tormented, he was wretched, and he makes the question, doesn't he, in the statement, who shall deliver me from this old man or this body of death that I'm in, the sin I can't get rid of through the blood of bulls and goats? I thank God, Christ Jesus, or the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, fear is not uh, peace, fear would be a sin. Yeah. Yeah, if you get into fear, then you're not on the word of God. Because perfect love or perfect peace of God drives out all fear. Obedience is the opposite of fear. Yeah, and uh, we've all done that. All been there. And every time you sin, we're faced with that. Um, I was so happy, I think I may have covered this, but it's a good time to bring it up. I was with Judd Smock three or four years ago. We were down at Ohio State University preaching. We had about 400 people out there in the yard. Nice sunny day, and Jed was really preaching up a storm on sin. That's his basic message. And uh, one of the Christians, because there's always Christians in the group that are trying to witness to the rest of them, but we get just as many attacks from the Christians as we do the ungodly. Because the message, if preached rightly, and Jed preaches it, if it's preached rightly, it'll make all of the quote-unquote Christians in the audience aggravated and hating you as well. Because they're living by Satan's lie. They're all living in the state of sin and they think they're saved. So when you go preach the right message, it burns them and bothers them and they begin to attack you. And so one of the girls shouted out, Well, Mr. Goody Two Shoes, how long has it been since you sinned? And Jed backed up. <clears throat> like he always did, thinks for a minute, comes back, said, well, I don't know, I suppose sometime last year, I don't remember when, and I just wanted to get the band in the orchestra and raise my hands and praise God. They had never, not a one of them, ever heard a statement like that in their life, in their church, no matter where they'd been, they never heard that. He couldn't remember the last time he sinned. Well, who wants to remember? You want a dartboard with it on? Poop. Sin last year or sin last week, sin yesterday, sin five minutes ago? Poop. How long do you want to remember that? If you're being led by the Spirit and you're following the life of the Spirit, you can't be in sin. You don't want to remember it. You're trying to move with God into holiness, perfection, and righteousness by obedience and love to His Word. Why would you want to give a thought to the last time you sinned, see? But nobody's been taught that this is possible. Well, how come the church isn't packed out? How come Brother Jim's church isn't packed out? Because he preaches the truth. My dear friends, because he preaches the truth, nobody comes. Praise the Lord. Brother Noah in the Old Testament, a preacher of righteousness, preached for 120 years after he found God was going to destroy the world. 120 years of building the ark. And what kind of a group did he have at the end? Two to four billion people went down the El Tubos by the same water that floated him. They were gone. They didn't listen to his message. Jesus comes to his own nation of Israel as their Messiah to confirm a brand new covenant with them, which was promised for 1,500 years, and they received him not. Jesus makes the most pathetic statement of my heart and mind in Luke 18. Eh? When the Son of Man comes again, he says, will he find any faith remaining on this earth when he comes, when that trumpet blows? He wonders, he questions, will there be anybody left serving me when I come? Not how many are crowded into the church. Is there anybody going to be left? Ooh, wow. Good questions, gang. Isaiah 26, 3. Got to finish. I don't want to keep you till 11. That's a threat, isn't it? This is Old Testament. Look, this is the groundwork for that which is coming in the spiritual, but it's said right here by the prophet Isaiah. 
26.3, Thou, God, will keep any person in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he's trusting or faithing in you. That's his ultimate promise, that Christ comes and fulfills spiritually. It could not be done back here. All right, Isaiah 48, 22. 22, there is no peace in their mind, in their spirit, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Who is a wicked? One sin or more. There is absolutely no peace. You've got a war going on between the truth. You know, just as Scott pointed out, the spirit Consciousness knows the truth. The person's will has made a choice against it. He's got a war right there. And he'll have the war until he comes clean with Christ. All right, Psalm 119, 165. Boy, a lot of verses. Put down in your little mind to read Psalm 119 and underline every word that appears in there that has to do with the Word of God. I think there's seven or eight maybe nine different words used to represent the Word of God. Go through and color them. I've got them colored in my book. It's the greatest chapter on the Word of God that you'll ever read. Okay, 119, 165. Great peace have they, they who, which love, obedience, your law, and nothing shall offend them. Okay, number two, Jesus taught that everything divided against itself could not stand. This is one of the most basic principles you'll ever get in Matthew chapter 12, 22. Once you understand this, you realize you can't be in sin and in the kingdom of God at the same time. But the church preaches and teaches it. They've got big buildings, big crowds, doing tremendous million dollar works all over the world, but they're not teaching the truth. I know, I've been to 49 nations where the missionaries have already been. And they're all believing the same lie. Matthew 12, 22. Then was brought unto Jesus one possessed with a devil, a demon, blind and dumb, and Jesus healed him insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is this not the son of David, the one prophesied that should come, the son of David? But when the Pharisees, the uptight religious people, heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out demons except by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of the devils, which is the name of the devil. And Jesus knew their thoughts, revealed to him by the Holy Ghost. He said unto them, Every kingdom that's divided against itself has brought the desolation, total ruin, kingdom, physical. Every city that's divided against itself has brought the desolation or ruin. Every house this divided between husband and wife has brought the desolation if it isn't corrected. But the house also speaks of every individual. For we are that temple. If you are divided against yourself, God, and sin, you will ultimately be destroyed by the sin unless you come out of it. No house that's divided will be able to stand. Three, James taught that a double-minded man was unstable in all of his ways, James 1.8. He didn't say in some of his ways or part of his ways or occasionally. And he's double-minded. He knows about Christ. He's not serving Christ to the extent of Christ's message. He's double-minded. He's unstable in all of his future decisions because none of them from that point on are going to line up with God enough to save him unless he repents, confesses, and comes back to God. He may give great money and preach great sermons and do a lot of things, but if his life isn't lined up free of sin, all of that is for naught. James 1.8, a double-minded man, woman, boy, or girl is unstable in all his ways. Because he's with the devil, he's committed to the devil, and it doesn't make any difference how much religion he practices, how much of the truth he knows, he's not living it. He's dead, he's unstable, he's allowed himself to be deceived like Adam and Eve, that you can be serving God and self at the same time. Number four and the last one, Paul taught that the war that a Christian fights is against principalities and powers in the world. That's who our battle is. Our battle isn't with tanks and guns against other nations. We're fighting spiritual wickedness and Satan's powers in this world. We're to put on our armor and fight against Satan and his evil agents. Second Corinthians 10, 2 through 5. We were there before to pick up one verse. But I beseech you, he says, 10.2, that I may 
not be bold when I'm present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which some think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Many of the people that Paul dealt with thought he was unsaved, unregenerated, because his message was so strong. They said, that can't be of God. For though we walk in a flesh body, here he uses the word flesh body, we're walking in the flesh body, we're not warring after the flesh body. Our war is not with guns and tanks and so forth. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, natural weapons, but they are mighty or spiritual through God for the purpose of pulling down strongholds, satanic strongholds that Satan uses. And we're to cast down, therefore, this is our battle, cast down these imaginations or reasonings, thoughts, and every high thing that would try to exalt itself above and against the knowledge of God, and we are bringing into ex captivity by our choice every one of our thoughts that it will line up to the obedience of Christ Jesus. In Ephesians 6.12, verse 12 finally sums it up for us, chapter 6 of Ephesians, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood out in the natural world but against principalities, against powers, these are all spiritual, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's where our warfare is, putting on the armor of God and standing against Satan's kingdom. So we want to prepare to do the true and false on the war of the flesh and spirit. So we'll turn to that page where the true and false start. I think we have uh, 40, 40 of them to do. And we got an email this past week from the North Pole from a couple that want to take uh, the course, a husband-wife team. that want to start the course. And so we've had some correspondence back and forth on email. And... We sent them a catalog on email, and so um, they're getting ready to go. Imagine that, the North Pole. However, it was in the state of Alaska. I didn't know there was such a place named North Pole in Alaska. It's actually a city in Alaska, but it makes me cold just to speak of the North Pole, Alaska. Okay, let's get at it. Uh, don't be afraid to holler out true or false. Point number one, man is a body and he has a spirit. True or false? Who said false? Why did you say false? Pardon? Ah, God created a spirit man and put a body on him. Yes, that's the correct way to look at that. He's not a body with a spirit. That's kind of the evolutionist's view, isn't it? And uh, so we kind of tricked you with that question. God created man, a spirit man, after his own image and gave him a physical body. Number two, flesh means body or outer shell in the Hebrew and Greek. 
True. That's one of the meanings, isn't it? All right. Three, flesh in the New Testament can also mean sinful nature. All right. We're looking a little semantics here. It doesn't mean sinful nature. That's a term that's used out here in the church today. As she points out, it means an unregenerate person. Person's unregenerated. Now, I don't mind the term sinful nature if it's used with the correct history that we have created it by choice. Uh, the church here worldwide believes that it's something you inherit from Adam and Eve. And so the word flesh does not mean sinful nature as they would mean it. But I have no problem using that because those of us who have sinned and um, broken any relationship with God, we have, or are called then the children of wrath. Because God's wrath uh, in Romans 1.18 is already against people that know the truth and have the truth. And they're not obeying it. They're holding that truth in an unrighteous decision. So his wrath is against all sin. One or more sins, his wrath is against them. But we don't want to connect sinful nature with the way it's used out here in the church today. Number four, the soul, the word soul is only used in the New Testament. There was silence for the period of 15 minutes. Soul is only used, the word, in the New Testament. True or false? False. It's also in the Old Testament, yes. Five, soul also means animal sentient principle only. That is the part that which an animal would have as well as man. Yes, that's one of the definitions of it. Seven, excuse me, six, the intellectual part of the man is his soul. False. It's the spirit part of man that was made in the image of God. That's where the intellect, the intelligence, the thinking, the ability to reason, choice, and so forth. Seven, spirit is used of angels, animals, demons, and man. What's wrong with that? Animals. Not used of animals. All right. Eight, the spirit is the intellectual, free moral agent part of man. Yes. No matter how deep they are in sin, they're still free moral agent, can make choices if they want to, to come back to God. That's why he offered the forgiveness to Adam and Eve and has ever since, especially through Christ at the cross. And there's no place that a man can be but what he can't uh, be in a state of repentance and come to God. See, now, much of the church and more of it will have to agree with us as time goes on, but this is Calvinism who believes that when Adam and Eve <coughs> sinned, that uh, sin was passed on to us. We're born sinners, and the moment we commit our first sin, we then lose the ability to choose. We lose the will or ability to choose to serve God, and we can't serve God. They say until the church comes, or until the, uh, God comes along and gives you the gift of faith. I mean, this is so different than what God's Word says. It's, it's an extreme lie that's uh, perverted uh, many, many, many millions of souls into dying and going to hell because of believing the error and the lies that are connected with this. You don't have a free choice until God gives you the gift of faith. When He gives you that, then you automatically can get saved and then once saved, always saved. There's a lot of lies in that whole statement of theology. <clears throat> Nine, the flesh drags the spirit into sin. No, the spirit of the man makes the decision to sin. The flesh doesn't drag him. We are told that we overcome the flesh, or any desires of the physical flesh, or any part of the regenerate, unregenerate life, we can overcome it. Ten, the soul is the part of man that feels. Yes, one of the things that it does has feelings, emotions, sensibilities. Everything that an animal would have, we have it there. Only the f emotions and feelings are of a different, higher nature because we have a mind to reason with, we have a memory, we have uh, an intellect, an imagination, which animals don't sit there and look at us and say, that's a human and I'm a dog. They don't have that reasoning ability because they were not made in the image of God. All right. 
11, the soul originates attitudes and affections. Anything else? Well, I heard it faint, false. The soul originates attitudes and affections. Pardon? Yes, that is the spirit. All right, let's move on. Twelve, attitudes, appetites, and desires are triggered from the body or the spirit. Either one comes from the body or the spirit. Thirteen, the spirit is the part of... Pardon? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thirteen, the spirit is the part of man that knows. Yes, part of man that knows or reasons, thinks, chooses, and so forth. Fourteen, the conscience, intellect, and memory and will are part of the soul. False, part of the spirit man, the image of God. Fifteen, when a feeling is triggered from the body, it comes from the senses or from some appetite of the body. Yes. Sixteen, when a feeling is triggered from the spirit, it comes from the memory, a new thought, or the imagination. Yes. 17, Jesus was tempted in all areas that Adam and Eve were. Absolutely, that's your Matthew 4 and Luke 4 give you the same temptation, longer drawn out by Satan and uh, in a different way, but nevertheless all three, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life are there. 18, sin is selfishly deciding in favor of reason against the claims of appetites. True or false? False. Just the opposite way around, isn't it? Sin is selfishly deciding, deciding, deciding in favor of the appetites versus the claims the stand of reason or intelligence. Nineteen. Sin happens in the spirit, man. Yes. There's no sin in your body, no sin in your soul registered in your conscience which is part of the makeup of the image of God and man 20 sin is imputed or credited or recorded even where there is no written law or law in the conscience false no Romans says where there is no law there is no sin but God first of all knows that he's implanted his moral law within our spirit conscience so that uh, he says in Romans 1.20, the heathen of the world, the unbelieving world, is without excuse because that's already there. And he proved that, didn't he? Paul did by the Spirit in Romans 2.14 and 15 when he tells you the Gentiles which did not have the written law were doing those things that were contained in the law which shows that the law of God was written in their hearts. What's that? Uh, the answer is no. There could be no crediting of sin where it isn't written or in your conscience. That's the only two places you get the law from. So the answer is no. You couldn't, God can't accredit sin to anybody that wouldn't have, have a conscience or have a written oracle of his law. Because the law is the thing that Paul says, is in Romans 7, he said, I was without sin once. Remember that in Romans 7, 9? I was without sin once, but then the law came, the knowledge of the law, either inner or outer from his parents or teachers. <clears throat> and when the law came, sin revived, or the Greek word is came alive in him, and he dies spiritually when he realizes that he is sinning against the law. <clears throat> prior to the conscience, or prior to his age of growing up, so he recognized the conscience speaking to him, and or the parents or teachers telling him the law, he was alive, that is, there was no sin. But as soon as he recognized either one or the other or both, he realized he was sinning, and uh, he dies. Does that answer your question? Okay. 19. Sin happens in the spirit man. That's right. 21. Okay. 21. James said that he who knows to do good and doesn't is a sinner. 
Yes. 22, the war of the flesh and the spirit is the war of a man's dual nature. Same person said true and false, didn't we? <laughs> we don't have a dual nature. This is another thing of the Calvinistic religion and the religion that has to eventually um, take over in the world prior to the coming of Christ. They believe you've got a dual nature. Part of you is holy, righteous, and pure, and you can't sin anymore, and you've got eternal life, and part of your nature is sinful and uh, can't ever be corrected in this lifetime until we get into the millennium or eternity, and then God will wipe it away. So the dual nature doctrine is about as dangerous as anything you'll ever hear. It is not of God. We have one nature. We, either by choice, make it a righteous, holy nature by choosing to serve Christ, or we remain a evil, sinful nature by our choice. 23. Saved and spirit-filled men begin to perpetuate the dual nature within the last century. False. Started out with St. Augustine, who was at the time saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, but he had the right doctrine, he had the right theology, but in contention with another man, he changed his whole position, and that's in his book, The City of God, changed his whole position and began to teach that we're born sinners. He was looking for a reason why children always sin, and he figured, well, if they always sin, they must have been born a sinner. And so then from his teaching, the dual nature comes in that when you get saved, part of you is saved, part of you isn't saved. 24, the war of the flesh and spirit is the war of our bodies against our spirits. What was that? Okay, anybody else? False. It's false. And this is, uh, that's a good thing this gentleman said what he did, because I wanted to bring up, hoping somebody would say that. Um, this is what's being taught today. <clears throat> that we have this war of our bodies, the flesh, against the inner man, the spirit man. But as we've already taken you through the war of the flesh and the spirit, we saw that the war is in a person as soon as he sins and has a record of sin in his conscience, and he knows the truth here and in his conscience as well, then the warfare begins because now he's in a state of sin and has a war going on within him. To the Christian who's free of sin, there is no warfare. Our warfare is out here against principalities and powers and demonic spirits and so forth. And so this is another uh, item that uh, comes from the church at large today, that we have a war constantly going on within us between the flesh body. The body wants to murder, and I don't want to murder. The body wants to rob the banks. I don't want to rob banks. The body wants to do drugs, and the body wants to commit adultery like it was a separate entity of itself. And the, the doctrine is an excuse to cover up sin and the choices of sin by man. We have no warfare for free of sin and living in Christ. That's the whole purpose of Christ's coming, something that for 4,000 years the blood of bulls and goats couldn't free man from sin. It only covered his sin, kephar. And Christ comes and dies who didn't have to die, and he dies voluntarily, sheds his own blood instead of the animals, and the animals were all a type and shadow of that, that he might, through his death on the cross, be able to remove sin from the conscience of any man, woman, boy, or girl in the world at any time from that point on who would call on Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior and confess and repent their sins, then Christ would be able to, for the first time to take away sins from people's lives completely. Therefore, once the sin is forgiven and gone, there is no longer a warfare going on because the conscience is at peace. Where there's no sin, the conscience is at peace. The warfare starts as soon as you and I commit one sin, we got a war going on because we know that's sin. We're already told by our conscience. We know from the reading, the writing, and the teaching we've committed a sin. We're guilty for that sin, and we've got a warfare going on in that until we confess and repent of it. So that's good to bring that up. 25. The past sins of Old Testament men bothered their conscience. Yeah, 
even though they could go through sacrifices and repent verbally, <clears throat> there was no way for them to remove the sin from the conscience, and God had no way either. We found out in Hebrews 10.4 that the blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin from the conscience. But they were a type, a shadow, an example of that which would come and be ultimately taken care of by Jesus Christ, that his blood would do it once and for all for us if we would believe that. 26, the war of the flesh and the spirit is the war of past sin against the conscience. The war of the flesh and spirit is a war True. Yeah. Not forgiven sin, but past sins that you've committed is warring against your conscience, against the knowledge of God that you have. And the only way, of course, to get rid of the warfare is to confess those sins and to repent of it. And 1 John 1, 9 says, God is faithful to forgive us of that sin and cleanse us from the unrighteousness of one or more sin, because one sin makes us unrighteous. Adam and Eve proved that. All right, 27. Paul teaches that the born-again Christian has a war in him. No, no warfare. That's what he opens up uh, Romans chapter 8. You remember in chapter 7, verses 15 to the end of the chapter, Paul keeps teaching us that little scenario. Remember? The thing I would do, I, I want to do, I don't do. The thing that I shouldn't be doing, I keep doing. Remember that? He went through that whole scenario twice <clears throat> because he couldn't get rid of the sin that was within him. And so he could get forgiveness and kill some animals and God would accept it, but he would be back into sin at some point because there was no way for him to get rid of that. That was Paul who taught that, yes. That was chapter 7 of Romans. Well, let me finish my statement, young lady. You can have my, you can, you can have my autograph at halftime. He does that in chapter 7. And remember in chapter 8, after discussing that, remember he says, Oh, wretched man that I am. He starts in Romans 7, 9, tells you what it's like when he was a child and he first sinned. I was alive once without sin. But the law came. Somebody started teaching. The conscience came alive. The law came. Sin came alive in me and I was dead. And then he goes into this wretched state of not being able to be free from sinning and he even mentions then in 725, O oh, wretched, miserable man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body, the old man, the old sinful nature, the body of death that I have created? Who will deliver me? And he says, I thank God Christ Jesus. That's where you come in. <laughs> and then he starts <coughs> right off in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore no condemnation, no miserableness, no wretchedness in those who are in a right relationship with Christ Jesus who are no longer walking after the flesh, the unregenerate man, but after the Holy Spirit's life. And that's what he dwells on in chapter 8. But he had to lay the groundwork in chapter 7 and he used himself as an example of a person under sin. Even though he was serving the Old Testament God, he was trapped. And God knew that, and that's why Christ had to come. Christ didn't come to give us salvation. Old Testament people had that, but they had it with sin still in their conscience. But Christ didn't come to give us salvation. He came to give us a better salvation in the fact that he dies as a substitute for us that if we would confess him, receive him and repent to him and receive his life, that uh, that sin would be removed for the first time in 4,000 years. And it would be removed from our conscience. We'd have more, no more conscience or guilt of sin. We'd be at peace. And uh, then he commanded we'd be filled with the Holy Ghost, who then we would receive the power from the Holy Ghost to be taught and led and guided into the truth. And uh, we would be able to overcome sin and not sin. Because sin is uh, abnormal to God from the cross on. It is to be the rare exception in the life of a Christian, not something that he's dwelling in at all times. Verse 28, Jesus taught that anything divided against itself could not stand. Remember that? A kingdom, a city, a house. And uh, then we use the illustration of a house, that we are the house or the temple of God. If we're divided, 
If we know the truth and we're not serving the truth, our house is divided or we will not stand. We will be destroyed in the ultimate end when Christ comes for final judgment. Unless that house is made clean, uh, we aren't going to make it. We can't be a mixture. 29. Paul indicated that ex-Jews in the church at Galatia were back under the law because of their sin. What did he hammer them for, do you remember, in Galatians? Yes, for keeping the law, which was then making them under sin. They were mixing, trying to uh, mix uh, the Old Testament, some of the Old Testament laws along with Jesus Christ, and consequently they were still under sin because the law could no longer deliver them. Christ has delivered us from the law. All the law did was to point out our sin. The law could not provide a new birth. The law had no provision to remove the sin. So we've got this today. Uh, when churches drag in anything out from underneath the law and put it along with Jesus Christ, it's already dead. The pastor that preaches it is dead. The congregation hears it and obeys it and thinks it's of God, they're dead. Any law. Because Christ has come to free us from the Old Testament law. The law was a schoolmaster, Paul wrote in Romans it was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Once we're to Christ, we don't need the schoolmaster. We don't need the paddle on the back of the hands. We don't need the dunce cap sitting over in the corner. We've been delivered from that Charles Dickens type of uh, schoolmaster with a switch. So churches today drag tithing over from the Old Testament. Tithing is universal. Every country we've gone to, 49 nations, I find the churches, the hosts that we're going over to work with, to open up Bible schools, they're sucking their people dry with tithing. They preach it Sunday morning, Sunday night, midweek. They're extorting them for money to keep the pastor's life, to keep him going with his car and his home and his nice place while the people are living in squalor. In Hebrews chapter 7 verse 5 said that tithes were taken under the law by the Levites. You don't see Jesus or anybody else preaching tithing in the New Testament. References are made to tithing under the Old Testament law, but they weren't teaching it. They were merely using it as a point in the New Testament of reference. When Jesus comes, it's give, give, give. You give out of a heart because the heart's free of sin. You don't need a law now. You give out of a heart that's free and clean of sin and filled with the Spirit. And when pastors draw a tithing back in, they're drawing a law back in along with grace and they're dead. Then they begin to observe certain times and days and months and so forth, and they begin to drag in a little form, if they can, from the Old Testament, and this is death to any church that does it. And my heart grieves today, and I think I've mentioned this before, that born-again, spirit-filled Jews, which are all over the United States in full gospel churches, have begun to pull out of these churches and establish their own messianic churches now. Churches especially for born-again, spirit-filled Jews. And why are they doing that? I mean, there's magazine articles. We're getting on that. Why did they establish such churches? Because they want to bring back some of the law, some of the Jewish flavor, some of the things that our Old Testament to Jewish grandparents and so forth had. Bless God. And so that's Jesus plus the law. <clears throat> and as soon as you bring in one or more laws, you're dead. That's what Galatians was all about. That's what Paul pounded them about. It was the keeping of the law that caused them to be in a state of sin. He called them foolish Galatians. The Bible tells us to call no man a fool. And Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? Sorcery term. Who has deceived you? Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the law or by faith? See? They would say, well, by faith. He said, okay, if you receive the uh, salvation, excuse me, if you receive salvation in the Holy Spirit by faith, why are you going back under the law to keep it? Most of them didn't understand it and didn't want to understand it. Bondage is a beautiful thing. If you're a leader in a religion, you can keep your people under some kind of fear and bondage. You'll implement any kind of a law you can. But if you're truly a servant or a shepherd of God, you feed the sheep, and then the sheep have to go do what they want to do. They don't want to follow Christ. They don't have to. That's what the whole purpose of John 6.66 is about. 
when Jesus got through explaining the fact that he was the lamb that was going to die and sacrifice his blood and his body, and he used terminology that he would understand. He said, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, that's the only way you're going to get to God. They realized he was saying that he was the lamb spoken of and prophesied through the whole Old Testament that he was going to die. That he was not going to be a king here ruling in a local kingdom. So John 6.66 says, Many, not few, many of his disciples got up and walked no more with him from that point on. Just over that one thing. He was talking about doing away with the whole concept of the law, coming into a freedom and grace that he would give them through his death and resurrection. They wanted no part of it. They wanted the law. And so his disciples got up, many of them, most, and walked no more with him from that point on. They were dead and gone. They were willing to hang around with him for the signs, wonders, and miracles. But the truth did not make any indentation into their heart. And then when they left, Jesus turns to the twelve, it says, if you'll read it in John chapter 6. He turns to the twelve and he says to them, now this is a true shepherd who has led them for three years. And he says to them, do you guys want to go also? See? No strings attached, no bondies, no nothing. I've got you with a hook. He turns to them and says, do you want to go also? You want to get up and leave with the rest of the guys? And Peter, Mr. Yo-Yo, Mr. Roller Coaster, who is in and out, and you never know where Peter's coming from, he says, where shall we go? For you alone have the words of truth. What a statement. So a true shepherd, all he can do is feed. If you want to wander, you wander. That's not the shepherd's problem. He'll try to go get you back, but that's your problem if you wander off. Shepherd's not responsible for your soul to keep you in track. He's responsible to preach the truth, give you the truth, help you and guide you, take you to the green pastures, but you can wander off anytime you want to. Okay, 30. James indicates that Christians have a war in their members. Yes, that was in there. He said, where there's envy, fighting, and strife, there's wars in your members. That is, within you, there is sin that isn't confessed and taken care of. Get rid of it. He didn't mean there was somebody inside that was shooting them with guns or hitting them with knives. There's war in your own members. Get rid of it. Get rid of that. Be made clean. 31. Paul and James both teach that the war is unremoved to sin, warring against the conscience of man. True. 32, the dead body that Paul wanted deliverance from is the old man. Yes, the man that we've created of sin, or a sinful nature, or the motions of sin, or the habits of sin. Paul uses all of that. 33, the old man is one's past life of sin. Yeah, your old man is dead. I tell people as a physical illustration, keep a shovel in your hand, and when your old man tries to set up from the grave, boom! Hit him right across the face. Just tell him, you're dead. You put him down. Because he tries to climb out every once in a while. You hit him with a shovel. Shovel of truth, they call it. All right, 34. The war in a Christian doctrine sets the stage for other false doctrines. Well, yeah, once you claim that you are in Christ and you're having sin in you at the same time, you will destroy every other doctrine that God has for you pertaining to the spirit man's life. It will begin like a cancer to eat up every other doctrine. And I, I tell you again, most of the world is going that way before the return of Jesus Christ. Christ in Luke 18, 8, and don't you forget it, Luke 18, 8, Christ says, when the Son of Man comes again, will he find any truth remaining on this earth? Will he find any true disciples? Will he find any believers? There'll be religion, but they will be serving another God, not the one true God. They will be laced with sin singing and dancing, thinking of going to heaven when they die, and they're already earmarked for hell. And Christ will weep over them at final judgment, just as he wept over Jerusalem before he pronounced the judgment on them. If he cried for Jerusalem, he'll cry for that which was the church that ultimately just melts down with all kinds of error 
like cancer eating up the truth. 35, we are fighting a war as Christians. True, but our warfare is not with flesh and blood, is it? Principalities and powers, workers of darkness in high places. 36, we are told to put on, on our armor and fight against the works of darkness in us. True or false? 36, we are told to put on our armor and fight against the works of the darkness in us. False. If we put on armor, whose armor is it? God's. And we're not fighting darkness in us. The purpose of the armor is to put on, to be put on a person who is free from sin, who is born again, has the power of God through the Holy Ghost, and he's fighting other spiritual warfare out here, not in himself. 37, the passages about an inner war refers to the life of a born-again Christian. False. 38, we have complete victory over the old man. Absolutely. We can resurrect him any time we want to, or we can keep him buried. 39, we have complete victory over past sin on the basis of the blood of Christ. Absolutely. 40, we may resurrect the old man any time we wish. Absolutely. Praise the Lord for his word, his truth that will set you free.